Hello and welcome to War for the Dawn 2.0. This will be our third War for the Dawn stream, going in depth into the upcoming long night, which will last, to answer your question, much longer than a night. Timmy Razika getting the super chat, gears greased and moving with the very obvious question how long will it last? Well, the long night, by definition, is when the sun is hidden for years at a time, says old Nan. Uh, that basically just means in a prolonged fashion, even a few weeks would qualify as a long night because it's longer than a night. That's what we're looking for. Um, it's a disruption of the normal day-night cycle. That's really the, the key. So in the books, obviously, I don't think we'll have time for the new long night to last years and years. However, it likely will last, like I said, a few weeks, maybe even a few months. But we'll get to that later in the stream. Welcome, folks. We have got lots of notes and lots of material to cover because, well, there's just a lot here. Um, I got into it and I thought this was I was almost worried about not having enough material to do a whole stream just talking about the others. Oh, we all know the others. But um, no, there's a lot. There's a lot here. So, <clears throat> you know, to start with. I'll give you a TLDR, as they say on Reddit. Too long, didn't read. That's what it stands for. Basically, it means you put a little summary at the beginning just to tell people what's going to happen so they know why they want to listen. So, folks, how do you fight the others? It's actually not that hard. Okay, first step. Um, and let me just uh, get my screen share going here. First step, guys. Yes, how to fight the others. And that, of course, is John and Tyrion by Mark Simonetti gazing over the wall, into the abyss. How to fight the others, like I said, it's not that hard. First thing you do, you're going to need some Wheaties, all right, because you need protein. You need to get your protein up, your strength up, like Michael Jordan there. Second thing, you're actually going to want to pair those Michael Jordan shoes. These are vintage uh, Jordan 5s. I think a lot, many of us that are my age had a pair of these. Some of y'all young whippersnappers got the, uh, got the reissues. But, yeah, you need some Wheaties. You need some Jordans. Then you're going to need a trampoline, um, preferably one without a net. Uh, see, there you go. That's what you want. Trampoline without a net, a uh, dragon glass knife, and then you're ready to kill the others. That's that's what it takes. Um, and then afterwards, you know, everyone's happy. You get have a beer together, and uh, and that's that. So it's pretty simple. Thanks for coming. The end. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Hardy har har. Let's all have a laugh. Yes. Um, if you've never seen that trampoline picture, that's how they did it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's funny is one of my favorite artists, Ertak Altanaz. Yes, they actually used a trampoline for that. That's why it looked so ridiculous. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite artists, before they explained what happened, because remember, after, the, after this episode, nobody really knew where Arya came from what was going on um and uh one of my favorite artists Ertak, he actually drew aria in the weirwood tree branches looking down at the night king like about to jump which would have made a lot more sense quite frankly than aria just pressing the turbo button and running past all the white walkers who are just like huh Did, was there like a breeze did something just happen oh gosh there's oh he's dead um, yeah, it would have been cooler if Arya had hid in the tree, especially because Arya has Child of the Forest symbolism. So if she had been up in the Weirwood tree, that would have been perfect. She would have dropped out with a dragon glass knife. That it's still stupid that John or Daenerys didn't kill the Night King. But if Arya's gonna do it, dropping out of the tree with a dragon glass knife would have been cool. But no. Yes, that's right. Arya cannot jump like a kangaroo, Isabel. Um it was uh she teleported the trampoline yeah i'll just i'll just throw this up one more time so you guys can fully appreciate this um yeah that's how they did the stunt that's why it looked like she was soaring from 15 feet in the air and again if she had just been in the tree that would have been hella cool but it was not to be <laughs> So starting off on a lighthearted note, we do have uh, lots of serious uh, others discussion here. Yes. Yeah, so folks, 
figured a good place to start with this was a little scene in A Storm of Swords where Stannis has come to the wall. And yes, there's some kangaroo emojis from Australia. Stannis has come to the wall and he and Melisandre, two of, two of my very favorite people, uh, are discussing the nature of the others. And this is uh, Bella Burgholtz here, Stannis and Melisandre. So this is Stannis speaking to Sam Tarly, and he says, You slew this creature with an obsidian dagger, I am told, he said to Sam. Yes, Your Grace, Jon Snow gave it to me. Dragon glass. The red woman's laugh was music. Frozen fire in the tongue of old Valyria. Small wonder it is anathema to these cold children of the other. On Dragonstone, where I had my seat, there is much of this obsidian to be seen in the old tunnels beneath the mountains, the king told Sam. Chunks of it, boulders, ledges. The great part of it was black, as I recall, but there was some green as well, some red, even purple. I've sent word to Sir Roland my Castellan to begin mining it. I will not hold Dragonstone for very much longer, I fear, but perhaps the Lord of Light shall grant us enough frozen fire to arm ourselves against these creatures before the castle falls. So it was a cool little little bit here. Um, here is Dragonstone by Arkazi. And of course, Dragonstone is volcanic, and that is why it has obsidian. If I put the camera back on me, I will show you some obsidian that I have. I've shown it many times, but of course, I've got a little deer antler obsidian knife. So this is really something that the Children of Forest might have produced, something like that. And I've also got hunk of raw obsidian somewhere right here. This is what you'd pull out of the mine, a piece like this, and then you'd flint nap it down, of course. So, uh, oh, I've also got, yes, my obsidian. Just keep, I keep this one close just because you never know. You might drop your weapons in battle and uh, you're about to be strangled by another and all you've got is your little, your little necklace. So here we are. Um, it, it's cool that Stannis is already mining it. Uh, Basically, as soon as he heard about what's going on with Sam and the White Walker, he started mining that dragon glass. So that's pretty on the nose. And of course, we know there is also some in the north because the children of the forest have been providing it for a minute as well. Uh, quick uh, super chat here about Jamie from Baba Ross. Um, could it be that Jamie gets his sword hand back? Love your work. What do you mean gets his sword hand back? Um, how do you get a hand back? Uh uh, yeah, I mean, maybe like a, you'd have to you'd have to be thinking about something magical, like a, a fire, a hand made of relorist fire um, with no hand. I don't even know if Makoro could grow like a fire hand such as Victorian has. Um, but it's possible you could have uh, one of pure fire magic somehow. But more likely this. Uh, you could just sort of. Why not like a obsidian captain hook like appendage? This might be the thing to do. Or Valerian steel hand. That would be cool. Get Gendry working on that. So uh, let me go ahead and throw my art back up here so I can talk about. First of all, Melisandre and Stannis, they are thinking about the true enemy. Let me just finish this quote out. So it's talking about mining the dragon glass and it says, Sam cleared his throat. Sire, the dagger, the dragon glass only shattered when I tried to stab a white. Melisandre smiled. Necromancy animates these whites, yet they are still only dead flesh. Steel and fire will serve for them. The ones you call the others are something more. Demons made of snow and ice and cold, said Stannis Baratheon, the ancient enemy. The only enemy that matters. So there you go. That's that's our vibe setting quote for the night. We are, uh, of course, concerned with the others. We're going to talk about the whites, the others, the long night strategies, physical properties, all of that stuff coming your way. As we are basically in the position of people like Stannis, Melisandre, Jon Snow, and Sam, when we sit here and talk about how to fight the others. These are the characters in the story that are talking about just that very thing, right? So it's nice to put, put their, ourselves in their POV and see what they know and what they're thinking. 
So it sounds like Melisandre is just learning uh, that the dragon glass kills the others. It, potentially, she did not know that. She's acting like she laughs and she's like, oh, of course, I figures. So that's that's kind of interesting. Um, but let's talk about Sam here. There's an interesting point where Sam Sam says, well, you know, I might have slain the other with the, with the dragon glass dagger, but when I tried to stab the white, it just shattered. And so we've all in the fandom, I think we've taken for granted or based on this, we've assumed that Dragonglass does not kill the Whites. Now in the show, Dragonglass does kill the Whites. In the books, we think not. And here is Matt Olson Art's depiction of Sam stabbing the White Walker. And there's Magali Villanueva's Sam Tarly. Here's the thing, though. Let me read the quote where Sam stabs the White Walker and see if you notice what uh, somebody recently noticed on Twitter. And I apologize, I don't remember who this was, but somebody pointed this out. There was no time to think or pray or be afraid. Samuel Tarly threw himself forward and plunged the dagger down into Small Paul's back. Half turned, the white never saw him coming. The raven gave a shriek and took to the air. You're dead, Sam screamed as he stabbed. You're dead, you're dead. He stabbed and screamed again and again, tearing huge rents in Paul's heavy black cloak. Shards of dragon glass flew everywhere as the blade shattered on the iron mail beneath the wool. So Sam didn't actually stab the white, at least not his flesh. It seems that it broke on the ring mail. So it's possible that we don't know the answer to this. It's possible that dragon glass does kill whites. You just have to get them somewhere in the skin or the flesh, not the armor. However, that could also be bullshit because um, the others wear armor. But I think that Valerian steel or dragon glass is not going to be repelled by the armor because the entire other, as we're going to talk about, is made of ice. The armor, the flesh, it's all made of ice and it all melts. So it could be that when you stab a white, you know, with the right thing, that any that any that uh, that it should kill them anywhere, that the armor shouldn't really protect them. But. It's hard to say. It's it is a reanimated corpse wearing armor. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. That uh, with the whites, it could be that dragon glass does work, but you have to uh, you have to talk to them real nice and get them out of their armor. That's right. That's right. You got to smooth talk them. So the armor is ice when we're talking of the others, but not the whites. The whites are just wearing whatever armor the corpses were wearing uh, when they disappeared. Hang on a second. So, and yeah, that, that really is a nice Sam from Magali Villanueva. Um, that's the Sam I have in my head, actually, when I think of Sam. Sometimes I think of uh, the actor, of course. Uh, but that was really a different character. The The TV show Sam is a lot bolder and more courageous um, and just kind of know it all by the end, whereas uh, book Sam is is not quite, not quite the same. Now, um, so... Just starting off with a little curveball. We're going to go over a lot of the a lot of information, A to Z kind of stuff. But I did want to start from the beginning just by telling you that it is possible. Dragon glass will kill the whites and the others. Now, what definitely kills the whites is fire. That is really the thing you want when you're fighting the whites. So the whites, here's the thing, guys. You're a lot more likely to run into a white than you are an other. A lot more likely. So let me go ahead and throw a couple of whites up here on the screen. On the left is Sigbjorn Peterson, and on the right is Ertak Altanaz. So we've only seen six others. There may be more others. We do not know. However, there are thousands and thousands of whites. And it does seem that the others use the whites as their army. Those others are kind of vulnerable. You can pop them, you know, if you got the right weapons and a trampoline, and some Wheaties and some Air Jordans. So they usually use the army of the dead to do their dirty work. So let's talk about the army of the dead first. And then we'll get into the others. As I grab my tea. Let's get teed up. 
Oh no, that is that is a good cup of tea. That is a very good cup of tea. Yes, thank you. So the whites are strong but slow. <clears throat> when Sam sees the uh, the White Walker, he thinks to himself, the whites had been slow, clumsy things, but the other was light as snow on the wind. So slow and clumsy, that's kind of the deal. Um, they are not the fast whites that you see on the TV show. They are slow. However, they are very strong. Um, Bran, near Blood Raven's cave, when they're uh, working their way up the slope, he thinks the things could not be hurt, but they were slow and clumsy. Meaning, until you actually kill them, they're not hurt. They're either burned or broken or not. And we'll talk about how to kill whites, of course, in a minute. Um, but the point is, they are slow and clumsy, but they are strong. And their strength really is in numbers and in their ability to absorb the slain into their army. One of the many discussed points on the show was the foolishness of a cavalry charge against the others, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> or an infantry, really. Like anything that isn't armed with the kind of weapons that can kill the others. They sent all these... Dothraki right into the army of whites and then they basically all just became whites uh, until they were needed again in episode 5 at which time they respawned in King's Landing because that's that's their respawn uh, location but point is they absorb the foe into their army and get bigger this is the reason why they are so impossible to fight um, you really need just tons and tons of fire don't know where we can find lots of fire so here's a here's um here's a quote from sam <clears throat> fighting small paul and it says small paul's fingers tightened inexorably and began to twist he's going to rip my head off sam thought in despair his throat felt frozen his lungs on fire he punched and pulled at the white's wrist to no avail he kicked paul between the legs uselessly the world shrank to two blue stars a terrible crushing pain and a cold so fierce that his tears froze over his eyes Sam squirmed and pulled, desperate, and then he lurched forward. Small Paul was big and powerful, but Sam outweighed him, and the whites were clumsy. He had seen that on the fist. The sudden shift sent Paul staggering back a step, and the living man and the dead one went crashing down together. So again, so strong that Sam feels like it's going to rip his head off. Um, easily the full strength of that the person had when living, and I'm imagining probably a little bit stronger. But they are clumsy. And they are slow. And so Sam, you know, is able to use his weight and inertia to sort of flip the white over. Um, and of course, at the end, he's able to grab the burning ember and shove it in his mouth. Uh, now, the thing about that burning ember, well, actually, no, I'll wait. I'll, I'll stick to the outline here. <clears throat> so our next... Uh, our most of our information about the whites actually comes from Sam Tarley's memory as he's fleeing from the fist. <clears throat> Sorry, just wrong pipe some tea. Hang on a second. Sorry for that pitiful strangling sound there. Ugh. Mm. Tea is good. It is good to drink, not to breathe. I'll, uh, I'll be okay here. Hang on. Uh. All right. Uh. <clears throat> Wasn't too bad. It was just a, just a tiny one. Yeah. Ooh, those can be uh, debilitating. So Sam's memories of the fist, again, gives us a lot of uh, information on the white. So I'll throw up this picture by Zippo514, if I can spot it quickly which has the fist of the first men. Oh, I think it's way up here. Where are you, Zippo? I've got pretty much all my best others artwork loaded in here somewhere. Oh, I've got more pictures of whites. How about that? So. This one is by Edgar Sanchez, and this is a particularly nice Army of the Dead 
with the others going on here. Um, this is L. Ann. This is the Queen's army. So it's Night Queen, obviously, with an army of others. Here is Urtak again, a similar concept, Knight's Queen, Knight's King with the army of the others, undead. This is Robert Simon, as I alluded to, fire is really the best way to handle the whites. So this is actually HBO con uh, concept art by Robert Simon. Uh, this is Urtak again. Again, the dragons, kind of the way to deal with them. Flaming Swords, also a good way to deal with the whites. And this is... Urtak Altanaz. Let me go back to this one. Set the, the vibe for the Fist of the First Men. And I'm not going to read the whole bit. This is just some uh, isolated excerpts from that. So Sam is thinking to himself, mercy, mercy. And then he thinks to himself, Maslin screamed for mercy. Why had he suddenly remembered that? It was nothing he wanted to remember. The man had stumbled backward, dropping his sword, pleading, yielding, even yanking off his thick black glove and thrusting it up before him as if it were a gauntlet. He was still shrieking for quarter as the white lifted him in the air by the throat and near ripped the head off him. So again, you can see this sounds like more strength than a human normally has. The dead have no mercy left in them. And the others, no, I mustn't think of that. Don't think. Don't remember. Just walk. Just walk. So I included that last bit because some people have said that, oh, well, there actually weren't others at the fist. It was just the army of the dead. No, the, the, the others command the army of the dead. And anywhere you find the army of the dead, the others will be close by. And Sam says, oh, don't think about the others. Don't remember. So he must have caught a glimpse of them when he was there on the fist. Uh, but in any case, Yes, you can tell uh, these these quotes are all going to give you a good taste of the fear and the brutality of fighting whites. Here they come, he heard a brother say. Notch, said Blaine, and 20 black arrows were pulled from as many quivers and notched to as many bowstrings. Gods be good, there's hundreds, a voice said, a voice said softly. Draw, Blaine said, and then hold. Sam could not see and did not want to see. The men of the Night's Watch stood behind their torches, waiting with arrows pulled back to their ears as something came up that dark, slippery slope through the snow. Hold, Blaine said again. Hold, and then loose. The arrows whispered as they flew. A ragged cheer went up from the men along the ring wall, but it died quickly. They're not stopping, my lord, a man said to Blaine, and another shouted, more. Look there, coming from the trees. And another said, gods have mercy, they're crawling. They're almost here, they're on us. Sam had been backing away by then shaking like the last leaf on a tree when the wind kicks up, as much from cold as from fear. It had been very cold that night, even colder than now. So again, just literally like three paragraphs of this is enough to evoke the terror of the experience. So they're crawling, they're walking, there's animals, like in a minute we read, whites all around us, he wrote, and when he heard the shouts, uh, when he heard the shouts from the North Face, coming up from north and south at once, spears and swords don't stop them, only fire. Loose, 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 a voice screamed in the night. And another shouted, bloody huge. And a third voice said, a giant. And a fourth insisted, a bear, a bear. All covered with hair. A horse shrieked and the hounds began to bay. And there was so much shouting that Sam couldn't make out the voices anymore. So fear is a big part of this. It's absolute chaos. The animals are panicking. There's dead animals coming at you. Um, they're crawling up the slopes that are too steep for people to walk up. So the even the dead people are like animals. And uh, yes, and amidst the all, it's it's getting colder. This this happens amidst a snowstorm as well, just to make things worse. <clears throat> then it says. After that, he remembered the dead coming over the stones with arrows in their faces and through their throats. Some were all in ringmail and some were almost naked. Wildlings, most of them, but a few wore faded blacks. He remembered one of the Shadow Tower men shoving his spear through a white's pale, soft belly and out his back, and how the thing staggered right up the shaft and reached out his black hands and twisted the brother's head around until blood came out his mouth. 
That was when his bladder let go the first time. He was almost sure. He did not remember running, but he must have, because the next he knew he was near the fire, half a camp away, with Sir Old, with old Sir Otten Withers and some archers. <clears throat> And then it says, they were loosing arrows at shadows in the dark. Sam saw one white hit, saw the flames engulf it, but there were a dozen more behind it and a huge pale shape that must have been the bear. And soon enough, the bowmen had no arrows. Then it says, his garron screamed and reared and almost threw him as the bear came staggering through the snow. Sam pissed himself all over again. I didn't think I had any more left inside me. The bear was dead, pale and rotting its fur and skin all sloughed off, and half its right arm burned to the bone. Yet still it came on. Only its eyes lived. Bright blue, just as John said. They shone like frozen stars. Thor and Smallwood charged, his long sword shining all orange and red from the light of the fire. His swing took near took the bear's head off, and then the bear took his. So the whites and the whited bears alike seem to like to twist heads that does seem to be their killing move um you're, not, you're seeing that over and over so watch out for your head folks and let me put uh oh the character whites yeah that's the one i want to put up here you go this is from character design studios this is probably what it felt like on the fist Although it does look like um, the person on the right holding the spear is probably a child of the forest and not a human. <clears throat> but yeah, in fact, this looks like the scene where they're escaping the cave with Hodor and the child of the forest throws the bomb, uh, loosely speaking. But it certainly conjures the feeling. And um, I've often, in fairness to the show, I've often pointed out that... Uh, the Hard Home episode, which is completely not from the books and not book canon, does a terrific job of communicating the terror of the uh, of the white attack and the other's attack. So even though it's not canon, it really does really just <laughs> capture the feeling of fighting the dead and how hopeless it is. And yet, um, Anu Aurora says the others, uh, well, the, the, they're... Uh, Celtic inspired because they're based on the she in large part and uh, the Celts were headhunters. So yeah, maybe that's part of what George is thinking there. In any case, the whites, yes, they're, uh, they're going to, they're going to grab your head um, and they're going to try to twist it right off. And there is a bear, a bear, but not covered with hair. So the thing about the whites is that they are very flammable. And the books really did make the uh, the show made the whites worse than they. Okay, hang on a second. I'm sorry. Bird discipline. Okay, so the whites are very flammable in the show. They are only semi flammable. In the books, they are very, very flammable. Um, in, like I said, on the show, they're fast. And they are not fast in the books. So the show kind of likes to over, overdo things sometimes. And they, they did a little bit. But uh, check this out. This is when uh, Sam burns the whited small Paul. It says, Sam wrenched himself sideways, pulling Paul with him. His arms flailed against the dirt floor, groping, reaching, scattering the ashes, until at last they found something hot, a chunk of charred wood smoldering red and orange within the black. His fingers closed around it, and he smashed it into Paul's mouth so hard he felt teeth shatter. Yet even so, the white's grip did not loosen. Sam's last thoughts were for the mother who had loved him and the father he had failed. The long haul was spinning around when he saw the wisp of smoke rising from between Paul's broken teeth. The dead man's face burst into flame, and the hands were gone. Sam sucked in and rolled feebly away. The white was burning, hoarfrost dripping from his beard as the flesh beneath blackened. Sam heard the raven shriek, but Paul himself made no sound. When his mouth opened, only flames came out, and his eyes... It's gone. The blue glow is gone. So a couple of things here. 
Uh, so yeah, going backwards, Paul's asking why should the dragon glass be effective against the whites? Lamal. Um, <laughs> because they are animated by ice magic. And if dragon glass breaks the sorcery that holds the others together, well, the others are held together by ice magic too, and ostensibly the same ice magic. So even though in one circumstance we're animating a corpse, and in the other in the other sense we're animating pure ice, they are the same sort of magic spells that hold them together. So if dragon glass breaks one, then it might break the other two. That's essentially the logic there. Now, we don't know if that's the case. I just want to put it forward that it's not conclusively proven and i think most people think that it is i used to think that um so we don't know because the dragon glass shattered on the ring mail so in any case like i said the whites are very flammable notice that sam all he puts in the white's mouth is a burning ember so it's not even a full flame it's just an ember but even just an ember is enough once it sparks the white the whole thing goes up in flames. So remember that part on the show in the Battle of Winterfell, they had the burning trench, right? Which is a good idea. And then what the whites did is they sort of walked into it and they just laid down on top of it. And the first few died, but eventually the cold of the whites put out enough of the fire for them to sort of walk through. Um, I don't think that's possible based on what we're seeing. In fact, if the whites are clustered together and you burnt, you got a few of them caught on fire, it seems like the flame would probably catch and spread throughout the crowd. Um, so I don't think that they would put out the flames. That's not for certain. We just, we don't know enough to say that. But just based on the idea that a little coal torches the entire thing to the point of freeing it of the bondage, this kind of indicates to me that if you get a good fire started in the middle of a crowd of whites, it probably will spread pretty good. So a flaming trench should be enough to keep the whites away. Now, the, the catch here is that the whites and the others, as we'll discuss, they do bring the cold with them, and they bring a snowstorm, and they bring wind. So you got to keep your fire lit. They might be able to put out the fire just with their winds and their storms and the pure cold uh, before sending the whites in. So we'll talk about th that ice versus fire dynamic later on. But just for starters, I want to point out that the whites are, in fact, highly flammable. So, again, dragon fire is a good way to do that. The flaming swords a good weapon against the others. And of course, Jon Snow is going to have a flaming sword. This is Urtak Altenaz. So fights with whites. This is, these are the weapons that you want. And the, the dragons really are the most obvious one. As we saw on the show, they did seem to be highly effective. Um, in fact, the dragons might be the most effective against the whites as opposed to the others, but getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that when we get to the whites or to the others themselves. So let's talk about, yeah. So uh, uh, Leaf, the child of the forest who saves uh, Team Bran, sneaking into Cold Hand's cave, gives us a little more information. So it says Mira led the way back up the hill, jabbing at the whites when they came near. The things could not be heard, but they were slow and clumsy. Hodor, Hodor said with every step. Um, up above them, flaming figures were dancing in the snow. The whites, Bran realized, someone set the whites on fire. Summer was snarling and snapping as he danced around the closest. A great ruin of a man wreathed in swirling flame. He shouldn't get so close. What is he doing? Then he saw himself, sprawling face down in the snow. Summer was trying to drive the thing away from him. <clears throat> the next he knew he was lying on a bed of pine needles beneath a dark stone roof. The cave. I'm in the cave. His mouth still tasted of blood where he'd bitten his tongue, but a fire was burning to his right, the heat washing over his face, and he never felt anything so good. Summer was there, sniffing round him and Hodor soaking wet. Mira cradled Jojen's head in her lap, and the Arya thing stood over them, clutching her torch. The snow, Bran said. It fell on me, buried me, hid you, 
I pulled you out. Mira nodded at the girl. It was her who saved us, though. The torch. Fire kills them. Fire burns them. Fire is always hungry. So you see the children of the fire, uh, the forest, they know how to fight the whites. Like, just one of them runs out of the cave with a torch and basically burns a whole bunch of whites. So if you know what you're doing, you really can fight the whites with fire. It's, it's a good, it's the first weapon to use against them. Even if you don't have dragons. Let me go back for a couple of super chats here. As my birds are having an absolute freak out. Didelphi Morphia says, so when the whites attack, you must literally keep your head. Yes, you must keep your head. That's right. I'll pop it right off. And John Merkel says, you may have talked about this, but whose side are the children of the forest actually on, the humans or the others? Corin does warn the trees have eyes again. So we will talk about that. That one's I'm definitely going to file away. I've got a whole section about the children of the forest coming up. Good question, though. It's an important one. Oh, man. It's a bird day afternoon. So another great scene where we learn about some whites is, of course, when John fights Othor. And uh, actually, I got a couple of PayPal's that came in. Let's see. Okay, Ludmila, I see yours. I'm going to wait because I've got a section for that in the notes. Thank you, Shadow Demon. Tyler's asking about how far the others could get in the God's Eye. I'll come back to that one, too. Juan is saying, you mentioned the Dragonstone colors. Uh, dragon glass has, comes in different colors. So the people that will eventually slay the Great Other, could they be hinted at through the color of their eyes? If John's eyes turn red, Danny's eyes are purple, and Bran's green sight are being hinted at by those specific obsidian colors, red, purple, and green. I don't know, maybe like the trident with those colors are a hint to something else. I'm not really sure. I wondered about that too, but I didn't really have a... Uh, I didn't really have a solid guess about that. Purple dragon glass would be pretty. That's that's about um, all I could say about that. Let's see. Yeah, I did. I saw that one, Anu. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. So. All right, guys. I am going to have to go get Cleo. I can't listen to any more screaming. It's really stressing me out. One second, guys. Oh, I was muted that whole time. I said Cleo's cute, but she's uh, not perching on this white sweater. No, sir. That's uh, not going to work for me. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, Cleo does always get her get her way. Thank you, Carl Karsnark, for rubbing it in. All right. So John fought a white, the whited Othor. And there's some good information in this scene. So I will read it. And I will put some art up. On the left is Mike Miller. And on the right is John McCambridge. At least it will be as soon as I share my screen again. Boop. So yes, on the left, Mike S. Miller. It's from the comic. And on the right is John McCambridge. Uh, just real quickly, no, I don't think we'll see any others attacking Essos. By the time the others attack, all the main characters will be in Westeros. This is a Westerosi story. So no, I, it, it, we're not going to see anything in Essos once we get to the Long Night, in my opinion. So there's a few things that I noticed with the passage where John fights the whited Othor. So first of all, 
Ghost and John are both able to get in hits on, on the white because it is slow. But once the white has them in their grip, neither Ghost nor John can break free. Again, testifying to the strength of the white. Um, and the wolf is a major ally. So John's trying to go to sleep and then wakes up with Ghost standing on his hind legs, scrabbling at the door. John was startled to see how tall he'd grown. Ghost, what is it? He called softly. The direwolf turned his head and looked down at him, baring his fangs in a silent snarl. Had he gone mad, John wondered. It's me, Ghost, he murmured, trying not to sound afraid. Yet he was trembling violently. When had it gotten so cold? Ghost backed away from the door. There were deep gouges where he'd raked the wood. John watched him with mounting disquiet. There's something out there, isn't there? He whispered. Crouching, the direwolf crept backward, white fur rising on the back of his neck. The guard, he thought. They left a man to guard my door. Ghost smells him through the door. That's all it is. <clears throat> Slowly, John pushed himself to his feet. He was shivering uncontrollably, wishing he still had a sword. Three quick steps brought him to the door. He grabbed the handle and pulled it inward. The creak of the hinges almost made him jump. His guard was sprawled bonelessly across the narrow steps, looking up at him. Looking up at him even though he was lying on his stomach. His head had been twisted completely around. So again, the head twisting. And of course, as you can see, Ghost is the first one to detect what's going on. Uh, yeah, the she are Irish myth, uh, but Irish folklore, oh man, you're, you're really splitting hairs here. Um, it's the same body, Germanic folklore, Irish fol folklore, Celtic folklore. These are all variations of the same family tree. So it's not, you know, but yes, Irish folklore. So um, where are we talking? Where are we here? Um, so it's getting very cold. Ghost knows what's up. He's Ghost knows that something is deeply wrong. He's freaking out to the point where John is intimidated, right? So then it says, um, it can't be, John told himself. This is the Lord Commander's Tower. It's guarded day and night. This couldn't happen. It's a dream. I'm having a nightmare. Ghost slid past him out the door. The wolf started up the steps, stopped, looked back at John. That was when he heard it, the soft scrape of boot on stone, the sound of a latch turning. The sound was coming from above, from the Lord Commander's chambers. A nightmare this might be, yet it was no dream. The guard's sword was in its sheath. John knelt and worked it free. The heft of steel in his fist made him bolder. He moved up the steps, ghost padding silently before him. Shadows lurked in every turn of the stair. John crept up warily, probing any suspicious darkness with the point of his sword. Suddenly he heard the shriek of Mormont's raven. Corn, the bird was screaming, corn, corn. Ghost bounded ahead and caught, and John came scrambling after. The door to Mormont's solar was wide open. The direwolf plunged through. John stopped in the doorway, blade in hand, giving his eyes a moment to adjust. Heavy drapes had been pulled across the windows, and the darkness was black as ink. Who's there, he called out. Then he saw it, a shadow in the shadows, sliding towards the inner door that led to Mormont's sleeping cell, a man shape all in black, cloaked and hooded. But beneath the hood, its eyes shone with an icy blue radiance. Ghosts leapt. Man and wolf went down together with neither scream nor snarl, rolling, smashing into a chair, knocking over a table laden with papers. So let me stop right here. The wolf has already shown its usefulness. It detects the white first. Um, then it's aggressive. As soon as John opens the door, the wolf slides past him, starts up the stairs, and then turns like, come on, aren't you coming? Then when John opens the door into the black room, well, wolves can see better in the dark. So Ghost goes straight in while John hesitates. Then, as soon as the man's eyes are revealed, the wolf leaps on him. So... Ghost is ghost's instincts here are a hundred percent for fighting the others. Um, I'm not sure if George is meaning to imply the wolves have sort of you know they've forgotten things the maesters they remember things the maesters have forgotten, you know, as uh Osha the Wildling says. But whatever the case, Ghost knows exactly what to do here, and again, you can see that. You know, you might think, well, what good are wolves against whites? Because they're, you know, they're undead. Well, 
we see that they actually would be a big help. So not only can they see in the dark, they can smell the whites, their instincts are to attack them. One of the only ways to kill a white aside from burning it is to break its bones. And we see that later in A Dance with Dragons, just skipping ahead. <clears throat> it says, um, The moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. Summer dug up a severed arm, black and covered with hoarfrost, its fingers opening and closing as it pulled itself across the frozen snow. There was still enough meat on it to fill his empty belly, and after that was done, he cracked the arm bones for the marrow. Only then did the arm remember it was dead. So cracking the arm bone breaks the spell as well. Um, it's a little harder than burning them, but the, the, the point is the dire wolves do have a way to neutralize the whites as well as just being strong and fast. So just wanted to point all that out. Um, and then, of course, you know, John struggles against the white. It's very strong. He slashes it across the face. He chops its arm off. And much like the Black Knight from Monty Python, he's like, merely a scratch. It's a flesh wound. Keeps on coming. Um, then he grabs John's throat and basically is going to strangle him. Um, and, but, but except for that ghost, again, comes back into the fight and leaps onto the back of the white and knocks it off of John. That, that is, of course, uh, when Lord Mormont comes out with a lantern. John quickly... Um, well, let's see. Yeah, so it's... Uh, he grabs the lamp from... The sequence is important here. John grabs the lamp. Then the raven says, burn, burn, burn. Then John sees the drapes that he'd ripped from the window, and he flings the lamp into the drapes. Then, after the fire spreads, he reaches into the pile, grabs a handful of burning drapes, and flings the whole drapes onto the white. And that is when it burns. So it's a team effort to kill the white. And we see that Ghost is a big help. And the Raven, although it's, it's you know, the Raven is probably Blood Raven uh, talking, saying burn, burn. But the Ravens are also a help uh, in the scene where Cold Hands rescues Sam and Gilly. The Ravens land on the Whites and basically they, they come out of the trees like a black cloud and surround the Whites and they peck at their head and essentially distract them and keep them busy so that the humans can escape. So we see that, and this makes sense, wolves and ravens are both carrion eaters. Um, and that is one of the reasons why Odin is associated with those two animals. But it also makes sense that Martin would write wolves and ravens as being effective in killing the whites because they are, in fact, carrion eaters. So there you go. Um, also, ghost smelled the white. Uh, they do have a smell. And Ghost also found the you know, Jafer Flowers and Othor as well. So the, the wolf, and Ghost did that on his own. He wasn't even instructed to do that. So again, we see the wolves have an instinct to uh, sniff out the whites and they know that they're a threat. They know what to do, et cetera, et cetera. So lest there be any doubt, The whites are, in fact, controlled by the others. It's one of those things where if you stare too hard at the book, you can start to wonder, well, maybe they're just raised in the north, or maybe there's, we only think they're associated and they're really not. Well, no, it's, you know, Old Nan talks about the others leading the hosts of the slain. And more, it's the way that the whites are used strategically, like in the Waymar prologue, for example. Let's put some new art up on the screen. Let's get some Waymar. Some Waymar artwork. Where are you, boy? This is Jay Machek. And this is Waymar fighting the other. This one is And Antonius. So now the thing about Waymar is that after he dies, Will remains in the tree for a while. Actually, I'll put up this one. This one has Will up in the tree. It's not a weirwood, actually, by canon, but the artist made it a weirwood tree. That's okay, uh, 
in my opinion. And the, on the left is Topo83, and on the right is Jonathan Burton. They both have Will up in the tree. So the point is, after Waymar is slain by the others, Will waits a long time, it says, before coming down. And when he opens his eyes again, everyone is gone. And he comes down, and he picks up the broken sword, and then all of a sudden, Will or Waymar is standing behind him. So in other words, Waymar doesn't rise from the dead until the perfect strategic moment when Will has exposed himself, he's come out of the tree and he's got his back turned. That is when the corpse rises. Similarly, earlier in that same prologue, we see that the others have sort of played games with the Night's Watch by leaving all these dead corpses out for the scout to find and then quickly making them move before the rest of the crew gets there. So that when Waymar gets there, he's like, oh, where are these corpses? Will's like, they were right here. So this is, this is strategy. The others are using strategy and they're using the whites to lure on the watch and then to manipulate them to coming into this clearing, which is where they want to fight. And then they had Waymar rise to kill Will again, right at the exact moment. So there can be little doubt, in my opinion, that it is, it's just what we think. The whites are, in fact, controlled by the others. And the others use them quite effectively. Um, also, Jafer and Othor, they don't wake up until they're taken back to Castle Black. Now, this is an interesting question about who's controlling Jafer and Othor, because they are on the south side of the wall. They are carried there. They don't walk there but they still wake up so that the enchantment of the others still works on the south side of the wall. And it's an open question as to whether or not Jafer and Othor have some part of their person left in them. Like, does do they know how to get to the Lord? Uh, do, do the, you know, sorry, let me start the sentence over. Do the whited Jafer and Othor know where to go in Castle Black because the living Jafer and Othor knew that? Or is this just knowledge that the others have? You know, is the great other or Night King or just the hive mind that controls the others, is it sitting there piloting the whites, Chafer and Othor, or are they sort of sent on a mission and then they wake up and still do what they're supposed to do? It's, it's unclear. But there certainly is a possibility and I think it makes sense if there's some small amount of the humanity trapped inside the white. It makes it more horrific that if you're killed and whited, that some part of your consciousness is prevented from moving on to the afterlife and forced to watch the horror that your corpse is wreaking on other people, potentially your loved ones. Um, another clue about this, after Vermeer Sixkins kills Thistle, Thistle becomes whited in the army of the dead. And it says... The things below moved. And by the way, um, Vermeer has made it all the way into the body of his one-eyed wolf at this point. So he's in the body of the wolf on top of a hill looking down at the army of the dead walk by. And it says, the things below moved but did not live. One by one, they raised their heads toward the three wolves on the hill. The last to look was the thing that had been thistle. She wore wool and fur and leather. And over that, she wore a coat of hoarfrost that crackled when she moved and glistened in the moonlight. Pale pink icicles hung from her fingertips, ten long knives of frozen blood. And in the pits where the, her eyes had been, a pale blue light was flickering, lending her corpse, uh, her coarse features and eerie beauty they had never known in life. She sees me. So, it's not just Thistle that sees Veramir, it's actually all of the whites. Every single white turns their head to look at Vermeer. Thistle's the last one. So I think what the author is communicating, that potentially the memories of somebody are absorbed into the hive mind. So every single white is now part Thistle. And every single white looks up at Vermeer and recognizes what has happened. That is the implication to me. If it was just Thistle looking up, then you'd think that this was an individual action by Thistle the White, but it's every White. So they're either looking up and saluting the warg, or they're looking up acknowledging 
you know, the hate that Thistle has that it has passed on to the hive mind of whites, something like that. Yeah, kind of like the Borg, exactly. It, that's what I mean when I say hive mind. The Borg is a hive mind, as a perfect example, yes. So that's pretty much the whites. I don't know that there's a lot to say about the whites other than that. They are going to overwhelm you unless you have fire. They do tend to bring the cold, like I said. Uh, when Sam is fighting the other, he feels it, or, or fighting the white, he feels it. Um, John, obviously, when he woke up, was freezing cold, like teeth chatteringly cold, like severely cold. So it's more well known that the others bring the cold, but the whites do as well. So I think what we can, can conclude is that the magic of the others that animates both the whites and the others and the ice dragons and the ice spiders and whatever else there is, this ice magic, it literally is cold. You get anywhere near any use of that magic and things are going to get cold. Very cold. So cold it hurts to breathe. And I don't know, some of you guys that live in more southern locations may not know what that's like. But there is a level of cold where any exposed skin hurts. Like you could have, you could be wrapped up in a parka, in a hoodie and all this stuff. And the little your little part of your face that's exposed, it just burns. It's It hurts so much. And it gets colder than that. And then you got wind chill. I mean, guys, the, if you don't know, you don't know. But those of you who know, like the cold absolutely can stop you from being able to think, from being able to move. It really is debilitating. So it's something to remember when you're fighting the whites and the others. It's not just a sword fight. It's a sword fight in cold so bad that you can barely breathe and your arms are heavy. You don't have your normal springiness. If you cry, the tears freeze in your eyes. Like, you know, I don't know about you, but I hate it when my eye crusties dry and they get all spiky and they hurt you like in the morning and you, you rub them out and you're like, oh, that was sharp. So I can only imagine frozen tears. That could really be painful. Isn't that right, Cleo? So let's talk about the others. We've pretty much covered the whites. Let's move on to the others. And uh, the art that I used for the cover of the stream is by John Jude Palancar. A very majestic snow knight. You can see the army of the dead in the background. Very nice piece of art. Not used very much, so I was pleased to use it for the cover here. Um, but let's talk about Sam and John having a conversation about fighting the others. And here is my Zippo 514 art that I was looking for. This, I believe, is meant to be the fist of the first men. Um, but it might not be. It might just be. It's just labeled Night's Watch versus the others. It kind of looks like John in the middle. John wasn't at the fist. So... I don't know. It gives you the vibes of the fist. You see the Night's Watch brothers trying to defend themselves with fire. You see the whites coming on. There's a snow bear, or not a snow bear, but a whited bear. So major vibes here. And of course, I've also used this for um, the last hero in Dawn. I have a version of this where I modified the sword to look white like Dawn. But just think about it as the watch versus the others. And let's read this famous passage of Sam and John basically strategizing against the ancient enemy. Sam's always at the center of these conversations, you'll notice. Tell me something useful, John says. Tell me of our enemy. The others, Sam licked his lips. They are mentioned in the annals, though not as often as I would have thought. The annals I've found and looked at, that is. There's more that I haven't found. And then Sam goes off for like a whole paragraph of like, oh, there's 996 commanders and we say you're this and blah, blah, blah. And then John cuts in and says, long ago, what about the others? And then Sam says, I found mention of dragon glass. The children of the forest used to give the Night's Watch 100 obsidian daggers every year during the age of heroes. The others come when it is cold, most of the tales agree, or else it gets cold when they come. 
Sometimes they appear during snowstorms and melt away when the sky is clear. They hide from the light of the sun and emerge by night, or else night falls when they emerge. Some stories speak of them riding the corpses of dead animals. <clears throat> Bears, direwolves, mammoths, horses, it makes no matter so long as the beast is dead. The one that killed small Paul was riding a dead horse, so that part's plainly true. Some accounts speak of giant ice spiders, too. I don't know what those are. Men who fall in battle against the others must be burned, or else the dead will rise again as their thralls. And then John says, we know all this. The question is, how do we fight them? And that's, of course, the question that we're trying to answer today. The armor of the others is proof against most ordinary blades, if the tales can be believed, said Sam. And their own swords are so cold, they shatter steel. Fire will dismay them, though, and they are vulnerable to obsidian. He remembered the one he had faced in the haunted forest, and how it had seemed to melt away when he stamped it with the dragonglass dagger that John had made for him. I found one account of the Long Night that spoke of the last hero slaying others with a blade of dragon steel. Supposedly, they could not stand against it. Dragon steel? John frowned. Valerian steel? That was my first thought as well, Sam says. So if I can just convince the lords of the Seven Kingdoms to give us their Valerian blades, all is saved? Well, that won't be hard. No harder than asking them to give up their coin and castles. He gave a bitter laugh. Did you find, did you find who the others are? Where they come from? What they want? Not yet, my lord, but it may be that I've just been reading the wrong books. There are hundreds I have not looked at yet. Give me more time, and I will find whatever there is to be found. There is no more time, John sounded sad. You need to get your things together, Sam. You're going with Gilly. And of course, then he sends him to Old Town. So. So. A lot of information there, most of which is correct. So it says the others come when it's cold or the cold travels with them. And we know this is true. Let's put up this one by and Antonius again. Um, it is, it's said over and over in the prologue with Waymar, how cold it is. Uh, all the scenes we just read, there's no doubt anywhere near the others, it gets very cold. But at the same time, the whole point of the long night is to spread cold and darkness through the entire earth so that they can come out in force over the whole earth and never have to hide. So they are essentially ice vampires in that sense. <clears throat> um, yes, uh, just checking on my super chats here. Looks like the only ones I have missed are... A couple of thank you super chats from Michael James with no question. So thank you, Michael James. You're actually really consistent about sending in thank you super chats. So I really appreciate that, my brother. So the cold does travel with them to some extent. However, the long night makes it cold everywhere, which sort of creates the circumstances for the others to come out. Um, now, the thing about the snowstorms is interesting. In the Waymar prologue, there's no snowstorm. And also, uh, when Sam fights the White Walker, that is one where Sam has straggled behind the column and the White Walker appears. Oh, look, there's a tantrum about to happen. Hi, girl. You thinking about having a tantrum? Are you? Yeah. Okay, come here. Put you over here. Don't fuck with the camera, okay? All right. They just want to chill. Yeah, yeah. So there's not a snowstorm in the Waymar prologue. There's not a snowstorm when Sam kills the walker. However, there is a snowstorm on the fist of the first men when they attack in force. So it is unclear whether the others can summon a snowstorm when they want to, or if it just if there's enough whites around the cold will create a snowstorm. It's hard to say. I tend to think they can probably c control the snowstorms when they want to. That would make the most sense to me. They're ice demons. And we will talk about the she thing a little bit later. Icy ice she are the others. 
Um, so yes, the others do emerge by night. We're going to go over that. Um, it's said that they ride dead animals. We know that's true. Raising the dead. Yep. They wear armor that protects against ordinary blades. That's true. The other swords, other swords can shatter steel. That's true. Uh, the dragon steel thing, we don't know what's up with that yet because we haven't seen anyone use Valerian steel against the others, but we are assuming that Valerian steel will slay the others. And I think that's a safe assumption. And also the children of the forest, of course, gave the Night's Watch dragon glass daggers. So we're going to go over all those in detail and, and some other points as well. But let me show you some cute little children of the forest. So here is Magali Villanueva on the right, Aeon Delirium on the left. And then we also have Blue Ultramare, which this might be my favorite Children of the Forest art. I hesitate to say favorite. Uh, Atlantis More Sets is really good too. Um, I love all the Children of the Forest art, to be honest. But this one is just awesome. And she has Obsidian Necklace, just like me. But one second while I honor our Lord Garth. So let's see. Um, I think I've got some Children of the Forest Dragon Glass. Bear with me, folks. Um, this, this I have been, uh, of course, been putting a lot more art in my presentations lately. However, uh, with this presentation, it wasn't uh, as organized as far as like you know, by person. We went over all the swords and all the fighters. That was really easy to do. I just have sort of a ton of others artwork in roughly the order of the things I'm talking about, but it's a little more scattered. Um, this one is... They've got like 87 layers or something here. Um, John Jude Palancar on the right and Carolina M on the left. So... This is probably the best Children in the Forest with Dragon Glass there. So I'll just throw that up there. Um, this is really important. The Dragon Glass weapons are, you know, someone asked earlier, are the others, I mean, are the, are the Children of the Forest our friends? Are they our enemies? Well, they may have had something to do with the creation of the others. Obviously, we don't know what the book canon is there. But bottom line, if they've been, ar if they've been arming the Night's Watch with Dragon Glass then they, they ostensibly are now on the side of the living. Um, if they helped create the others, then it must be an experiment that got out of control. That's sort of the story the show went with. Uh, in the books, I do think it's more a case of humans breaking into the Weirwood Net and stealing their magic that creates the others. Uh, but either way, the, the Green Seer, Child of the Forest magic is definitely connected to the others. Uh, but I've got a whole section at the end where we're going to talk about the children of the forest as an ally. But since it is mentioned, I wanted to throw this up on here and get the uh, get the idea in the bloodstream. They're really we really are lucky. Uh, one of the good things about a song of ice and fire taking so long to finish is that we now have so much fan art. I don't even fan art is not maybe the right word, but we there's so much art of a song of ice and fire that people have done. So now it's just. It's just, it's hard to get, um, it's hard to, uh, to pick. That's why I've got so many images in this one here. But let's talk about the others. The White Walker, if you will. The, the enemy itself. Let me put them up on the screen.
the two probably most well-known pictures of the others would be this one by uh, on the left Magali Villanueva and on the right John Picasso. So the left is obviously a Weimar prologue scene. You can see the one other, and then on the right, this is just three others coming at you in the woods. Um, both of them capture the white shadow feel with the ones in the background. And then you can see the ice armor, really well depicted in both of these. And again, that's Magali Villanueva on the left <clears throat> and John Picasso on the right, who have both done a Song of Ice and Fire calendars. And I believe both of these pieces are from the calendars. So... <clears throat> The White Walker, friends. The White Walker. Its only known vulnerability is dragon glass. Valerian steel probably will work. We know dragon steel did, whatever that means. That might have been Dawn or the first, you know, Lightbringer sword, which may have been a forerunner of Valerian steel from the Great Empire of the Dawn, anything like that. It was some sort of magic sword. And calling it dragon steel means. It's either forged in dragon fire like Valerian steel, or it's made from a meteor, since meteors can be dragons. It's got to be one of those things, or both. So Valerian steel, I feel like, is a pretty safe bet. It probably does kill the others. What's the bloody point of having all the Valerian steel? Um, if you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. So dragon fire, this is an open question. Does dragon fire kill the others? We do not know. To me, it could make sense either way. Um, if Dragonfire does burn the others, then you, you kind of have to give the others as a writer, as in George's position, uh, an expert D&D &D player, George Martin is, you have to give the others a weapon that can resist the dragons. Otherwise, the dragons could just swoop in and melt them, and that's the end of the story. That would be a little too easy, potentially. So I'm that's why I'm saying the others... It seems like they can control snowstorms and summon snowstorms. Uh, and I think the one thing that the show got right in their short night episode was showing those big cloud banks of cold mist and ice and sleet. And the dragons, once they flew into them, they didn't like it. They couldn't see. It was hard to fly. And we've seen that. The dragons don't like the rain either. Um, in the battle, the last storm at Storm's End between... Argalac Durndon and Ori's Baratheon. I believe it was Rainey's that brought uh, Melly's, or not, I'm sorry, Rainey's dragon was Meraxes. And Meraxes was essentially grounded in that fight. It was raining so hard, it couldn't effectively fly. So it just chilled out on the ground and killed people with its tail and its claws, which was very effective also. So we have every reason to think that the dragons don't fare well in bad weather exactly um in addition to this we of course got the interesting detail in fire and blood and this is why i can't have cleo on my shoulder come here step up come here it's i knew it was just gonna be a day like that um when queen alisanne tries to fly a silver wing near the wall <laughs> you get a tantrum about that girl Silverwing refuses. They try three times. Alisanne tries three times to get Silverwing to fly over the wall. Three times she turns away. So we do not know if there's a hard spell on the wall. The same one that ostensibly keeps the others and the whites out might also keep the dragons out. Or it could be that the wall is being made of ice magic. That is what is repelling the dragon, meaning that anytime the dragons are going to come around strong ice magic, they're not necessarily going to want to attack. They're going to want to fly away. So either one of those could make sense, but it definitely shows that there are magical enchantments that can either deter the dragons or ward them off completely. So it seems like the dragons and the others, they may be able to injure each other but they've also got weapons to ward each other off. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the others do have ice spears that can kill the dragons. 
Um, if the dragon fire melts the others, then potentially a weapon of ice like that could kill the dragon. I do think I do think that could happen. Um, yes, hold tight the cockatoo tantrum. Hold it tight, girl. She's doing okay. She's she's fought it back down. She's she's suppressed it. So I do think that the dragons versus the others could be a bit of a stalemate. Um, and again, I will say that the dragons, mostly they will be handy for fighting the whites. To kill the white walkers might take people. You know, the, you use the dragons to subdue the whites, and then you've got to get people close enough to the white walkers to slay them. Um, I do think that's how it's going to go. And I do think that the white walkers tend to use the whites to do their dirty work to protect themselves. Um, there's probably only a limited number of white walkers. We don't know uh, how hard it is to make new ones. Um, I've even speculated that they're taking Craster's babies not to make new white walkers, but just to sustain their own existence. And of course, we don't know. That's all speculation. But I do not expect there to be hundreds of white walkers. We're probably talking about six or a dozen or a handful, something like that. So it's really, they use, and if you think about it, if you're thousands of years old and you can be killed with a touch, just one touch from a magic weapon, and honestly, there's plenty of dragon glass around, you'd be pretty paranoid, honestly. Those white walkers would be paranoid. They wouldn't want to come anywhere near dragon glass or valerian steel. Six of one, half a dozen of the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see how this is. They use the army of the dead to keep every the dangerous things away from them. They only come out in the cold and in the dark. So yeah, they they are thousands of years old and any each white walker that dies is a unique tragedy because of that. Just like with the children of the forest, they are few in number, so when one of them dies, you know, yeah, there's 19 castles on the night's watch. Craster also has 19 wives. So Perhaps there's 19 white walkers. I do not know. What do the walkers want with sheep? So one of the, one of the, this is what led me to, one of the things that led me to believing that uh, they're taking Craster's babies to sustain their own existence, not to make new white walkers. I think only Night's Queen can make white walkers, uh, I suspect. So this makes sense. Um, the sheep would basically be a lesser blood sacrifice. So it could be that innocent animal sacrifices give you 10 mana points, whereas a human baby from Craster gives you 100 mana points, something like that. Otherwise, it really doesn't make any sense for the White Walkers to take sheep. They must be using their blood to power spells, to, keep, to perpetuate their own existence. That is my answer to that question. The dragon Nefertaria says, it makes sense that the wall made with ice magic would work well against the dragons, but the others are living ice magic. How did that work? Um, yes, yeah, so how does the wall ward the others when the wall is made of ice and the others are made of ice? That is a question we don't know for a fact that it does. <laughs> I mean, I think it does, but that's only something that is said. We don't know that for sure. However, it could be that the spells woven into the wall are more than just ice magic. It could have been green seer and fire magic all woven together. There could be a fused or oily black stone foundation under the ice wall. Uh, it could be the weirwood magic that underpins the wall that keeps the others out. Or it could be that the ice magic was wielded by a Stark that uses ice magic and not the others. And so that is why it works. But what we're told is that the the wall, the spells on the wall, they, they keep out dead things. So cold hands can't cross, the whites can't cross, the others are dead things too. So it just seems that that's the case. That's why the dragons don't quite fit because the dragons are alive. They definitely are alive. Um, so 
I'm wondering, I think that the dragons probably could fly over the wall and it's just that it didn't want to. But on the other hand, we also know the wall's probably going to get broken before the others invade. So once the wall is broken, the dragons will be able to fly north anyways. And I don't think they will need to fly north until the others invade also. So it could be fairly academic once the wall is broken. Yeah, you're hearing Goose in the background. He's in the other room. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that is that is their vulnerability. Now, one thing that's interesting is just fire in general. Um, Tormund tells John, every nightfall, we'd ring our camps with fire. They don't like fire much and no mistake. And he's talking about the others there. So... It could be that regular fire, when they say dismay the others, I don't know what that means. Um, maybe it like just hurts them. Like it burns burns to the touch, but it won't kill them. That's probably what that means. Um, and then in, uh, Old Nan tells Bran, they were cold things, dead things that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun and every creature with hot blood in its veins. Now the idea of things that hate iron and fire, that's an old fae idea a fairy idea um so i think george is adapting human folklore a little bit however uh this also could be the truth of this could be that what they're really afraid of is magical flaming swords and that that, that got remembered as oh they don't like iron and fire because we know that steel and iron are no problem they can shatter steel but dragon steel is a problem so what I think is that this is a dim memory of flaming swords, dragon steel swords, and that that's remembered that they don't like fire and iron. However, like I said, it could be just be that fire sort of burns them a little bit. No, girl, you can't call me my verse. But it also could be that they don't like fire because it prevents them from sending their whites, and that's really what they want to do. So... No, 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 says maybe the others are genderless like the dragons. It could be, but they seem like a brotherhood just because Craster only gives male sons. And they're referred to as Craster's brothers. Uh, they also have a lot of parallels with the Night's Watch. Um, and then we have the description of Night's Queen who sounds so different. So I think it's that they're all male. They're all sons. And then Anu Aurora asks, what's the best way to support the channel if busy people had to do only one thing? Leaving a comment. Uh, that's the simplest way because it's free. Every time you watch a video that you like on YouTube, in fact, the, the polite thing to do, the way to support the channel that you're watching is just to leave a quick comment. Like the video, leave a comment. So that's how I'll answer that. Thank you, Anu. All right, guys, one second. I need... Okay, let me go ahead. I turn the lights down. Let me go ahead and pull the curtains. Sorry, guys. One second. Sorry, I'm doing my best. The birds are being really difficult today, guys. Um, thanks for bearing with me. Oh, God. Shut the fuck up. Now my phone is playing my live stream. Okay. For everyone, we'll just settle down.
everyone being inanimate objects and animals. Okay. Where are we? So the others, let's talk about the others themselves. They are snow knights. They have ice armor, ice bones, and ice weapons, right? You could probably say these lines by memory with me. A shadow emerged from the dark of the wood. It stood in front of Royce. Tall it was, gaunt and hard as old bones, with flesh as pale as milk. Its armor seemed to change color as it moved. Here it was white as new fallen snow, there black as shadow, everywhere dappled with the gray green of the trees. The patterns ran like moonlight on water with every step it took. And these are great for ice armor. And my other favorite one is this one by Lee Moyer, which gets the mirror like the watery reflections of the trees just, just nails it. These are also very alien looking others, of course, which is cool because the, the others are a little bit alien. But here you see the reflective armor. Look up in the upper right corner. You can see that one arm hanging down in the foreground. And you can see it's it really is like patterns on the water, reflections on the water. And there's poor Waymar. So it says, in its hand was a long sword like none Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into the forging of that blade. It was alive with moonlight, translucent, a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed to almost to vanish when seen edge on. There was a faint blue shimmer to the thing, a ghost light that played around its edges, and somehow Will knew it was sharper than any razor. So they have icy swords, they have icy armor, and of course, when they melt, we see that they even have milk glass bones and blue blood. Sam, a clash of kings. When he opened his eyes, the other's armor was running down its legs in rivulets as pale blue blood hissed and steamed around the black dragon glass dagger in its throat. It reached down with two bone white hands to pull out the knife, but where its fingers touched the obsidian, they smoked. Sam rolled onto his side, eyes wide as the other shrank and puddled, dissolving away. In 20 heartbeats, its flesh was gone, swirling away in a fine white mist. Beneath were bones like milk glass, pale and shiny, and they were melting too. Finally, only the dragon glass dagger remained, wreathed in steam as if it were alive and sweating. And of course, when Gren tries to pick it up, he flings it down. It is so cold. So this is interesting. Even though it has bones and armor and flesh and eyes and hands and all these anatomical parts everything melts right everything melts so we can say that it was all made of ice it really just was it really just what it really just was frozen water and magic that is what the others are so george has given them human anatomy the bones in particular and the blood he wants to communicate that these are they have some sort of human heritage and of course they ride horses and they speak and they have customs and they do all kinds of human-like things. And my theory is that the others are essentially the spirits of dead green seers that were ripped out of the weirwood trees. That's the short way to say it. But they would have once been green men or humans or whatever green men were, which is some sort of humanoid creature. Oh, I keep trying to clear my throat. Just cannot get it. Okay. Everything's a struggle today, but that's what it's like fighting the others, right? It's a struggle. So let's embrace it. We're embracing the struggle. So they're made of ice. Everything melts. They are essentially snow knights. Um, they are very quick. They're quicker than Sir Waymar anyways, because of course, Sir Waymar, who is a decent sword fighter, he's castle trained. He has a nice sword. So his he's at least like a seven out of ten, you know. The other is faster than him. And then, of course, when Sam fights it, it says the other slid gracefully from the saddle to stand upon the snow. So quick, graceful. And then here, here's the actual quote. It says, uh, 
Get away, Gren took a step, thrusting the torch out before him. Away, or you burn. He poked at it with the flames. The other sword gleamed with a faint blue glow. It moved toward Gren, lightning quick, slashing. When the ice blue blade brushed the flames, a screech stabbed Sam's ears sharp as a needle. The head of the torch tumbled sideways to vanish beneath a deep drift of snow. The fire snuffed out at once, and all Gren held was a short wooden stick. He flung it at the other, cursing, and small Paul charged in with his axe. So here we can see again, when we talk about fire dismaying the others, we're given a hint of that, right? Because when the blade brushes the flame, there's that sound. It's a horrible keening sound. So it seems like the other's magic has been irritated or activated here. So the flame does dismay it, but it doesn't break the sword or melt the sword or melt the other. Um, however, the other is, is the first thing the other does is destroy the torch. So that kind of shows you that's the one weapon it fears in the room is the fire. The first thing it does is neutralize that. And the sound that happens gives us a little bit of a clue that if you had a lot of fire, like if you if you bathed an other in dragon fire, it probably would melt. It would at least dismay it. It, it would have third degree burns. <laughs> no, I think I think for real, if 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 regular fire dismays the other, I think uh Immolating it in dragon fire should probably do the trick. Uh, continuing with the scene, the fear that filled Sam was then worse than any fear he had ever felt before, and Sam Tarly knew every kind of fear. Mother, have mercy, he wept, forgetting the old gods in his terror. Father, protect me. Oh, oh. His fingers found the dagger, and he filled his hand with that. The whites had been slow, clumsy things, but the other was light as snow on the wind. It slid away from Paul's axe, armor rippling, and its crystal sword twisted and spun and slipped between the iron rings of Paul's mail, through leather and wool and bone and flesh. It came out his back with a hiss, and Sam heard Paul say, oh, as he lost the axe. Impaled, his blood smoking around the sword, the big man tried to reach his killer with his hands and almost had before he fell. The weight of him tore the strange pale sword from the other's grip. And that is when Sam charges in and kills it. So we, we can see the others are quick, um, but its sword can be knocked from its hands or taken from it. Uh, and then it is a little bit easier to kill. So there, some of the basic principles of fighting a person do apply here. If you can get their sword away, they're easier to kill. Um, the others, it's not like the T-1000 Terminator, where you rip the sword away, and then he just sprouts a new sword in his hand. He just instantly condenses the air and makes an, a new ice sword. Um, he only had a second there before Sam stabbed him, so maybe, maybe they can do that. But we don't see that happen. So it is, maybe there's only a limited supply of those other swords, just like there's a limited supply of Valerian steel. We don't know. But I did think it was interesting that he was disarmed. And he's very quick. He got he got around the two Night's Watchmen. It took three Night's Watchmen to kill him. Two of them had to distract him while Sam essentially got him with the dragon glass. Leaf Turambar. Shout out to Turin Turambar. On a hike today, I found a tooth fungus covered in hoarfrost and thought of a miniature frost fang mountain range stretched before me well, that sounds like a cool walk and that's something that happens to you when you do enough a song of ice and fire you uh you just end up looking for that symbolism everywhere which is part of the point i think of teaching us all how to use symbolism as george has done Hey, thanks, some guy sent me a PayPal to combat the struggle. Appreciate that. So let's change up the art here. Let's go with Maester Yu on the left and Death's Prodigy on the right. These are both good sort of anatomy of a White Walker pictures. The fellow on the right doesn't have his armor, but this is a great picture 
of what ice condensed into a body might look like. So it's even got the the cross check pattern of the hoarfrost on there, which I definitely approve of. So very cool. And on the left is more of a weirwood looking white walker, which I like as well. So the next thing I want to say about the others is there's there's strange sounds. So we just heard when the sword brushed the flame, there was some horrible screeching sound, right? Well, we hear that a few other times. Um, when Sam hits it with the dragon glass, it says he heard a crack, like the sound ice makes when it breaks beneath a man's foot, and then a screech so shrill and sharp that he went staggering backward with his hands over his muffled ears and fell hard on his arse. So it's it's a sound so terrible that you literally involuntarily cover your ears from it. Just for what it's worth. And then in the Game of Thrones prologue, it says the pale sword came shivering through the air. Sir Waymar met it with steel. When the blades met, there was no ring of metal on metal, only a high, thin sound at the edge of hearing, like an animal screaming in pain. Again and again, the swords met until Will wanted to cover his ears against the strange, anguished keening of their clash. So this is the song of ice and fire, people. It's uh it's awful. It's hard to listen to. <laughs> Apparently that's that's the song. It's uh it's not a sweet song. It's the sound of battle. It does not sound like Peter Gabriel. Give me steam. Although it should. Steam is what you get when you mix fire and ice. Instead we get Screams, screams instead of steam. Sledgehammer, talk to me. All right, that's enough. Talk to me. Yeah, Peter Gabriel's videos are awesome, man. You want to take some mushrooms and look at those. Or weirwood paste, rather. That's what we... Anyways, moving right along. The others are identical. Going back to the prologue, it says, They emerged silently from the shadows. Twins to the first, three of them, four, five. Sir Waymar may have felt the cold that came with him, but he never saw them, never heard them. And then a moment later, it says, behind him to right to left, all around him, the watchers stood patient, faceless, silent, the shifting patterns on their delicate armor, making them all but invisible in the wood. And we just stared at the Lee Moria picture again, but I'll just put it up. So again, shifting patterns, making them all but invisible. This one is capturing that. Like, just think about how invisible they would be in the dark, in the woods. They really would look like shadows, just look like little warp mirages with eyes. So, tough to spot. And all identical. I don't know what that means. Beyond the obvious, which is that they're part of a hive mind, their clones, something like that. Uh, you know, again, I, I talked about green seers being ripped out of the weirwoods, but of course the green seers, when they die and go into the weirwood net afterlife, they become a hive mind. So it's basically like an entire original hive mind being ripped out of the weirwoods to create the others. So there may not be a puppet master. There may not be a great other or dead knight's king spirit in the weirwood net. There may be, but there doesn't have to be. They could simply be a hive mind in and of themselves, and that's just what they are. So I think the twins is sort of a clue about that. So um, let's see here. Hey, go ahead, check it. Someone knocking on my door. Okay, so let me put up a little something different. So this is Didier Graffé on the left and Dread Jim on the right. Um, the others do ride dead animals, as we've heard. We've seen that. Uh, the one that Sam fights is riding a dead horse. 
uh, but we're we're told they can ride other other animals too. So if we see an other riding, say a snow bear or a mammoth, we shouldn't be surprised that that could be coming our way. Um, and I think I have a picture of that as well. Yeah, I sure do. So on the left is Jovan or Jovan Delic, and on the right is BZ Rat. So you see, um, we see a skin changer with a boar, Baroque. So we could get a whited boar, a whited bear, a whited mammoth. Any of these things are on the table. Just to add to the sort of terror and confusion. I want to see another riding a skateboard, to be honest. Yeah, that's a good call. So I do, by the way, I do have a new others theory coming in short order here that I'm working my way towards. So stay tuned for that. We're not just going to go over information. I do have a new theory. So they ride dead animals. And uh, they are, they are the white walkers of the wood. That's their full name. And now let's, we'll talk about the, the she and the idea of the others as forest guardians. So this art is by Red Anne 23. This is a classic piece of others artwork. It's very white walkers of the woodsy here. It's like one other and two whites, or maybe two others and a white on the left. Hard to say. But the language of them, so the idea of the she is just this. The, the she, they are fey creatures. It means people of the mounds, and they are associated both with sacred burial mounds and sacred woods. And essentially, the idea is that they defend their territory. You can leave them gifts and please them, or you can trespass and earn their ire. Um, the she also are known for stealing babies, uh, the changeling myths, where they steal a baby and leave a fey creature there instead. This That all has to do with the she as well and related folklore. Um, so <clears throat> the others stealing babies, that's a she thing. The others um, being sort of avatars of this haunted forest, um, that is a she thing. If you look at the, uh, the prologue, it reads exactly like that. Waymar is the trespasser. The forest is basically clinging at Waymar trying to get him to turn back. His companions are trying to get him to turn back, the experienced trackers, and he's headstrong, and he plows into the forest anyway, and then he meets the icy she, and they come out and kill him for trespassing, essentially. So, big part of the others is understanding that component. They, they defend their territory, and this also alludes to the theory that I was saying where I think the others are green seers that have been ripped out of the weirwoods. So the original trespassing was Azor High invading the weirwood net and pushing out the old hive mind. So their woods are the weirwoods, and they've been essentially evicted from their wood by Azor High, and that is essentially why they are pissed and why their story is going to have something to do with the weirwoods. Um, they look like weirwoods. So, for example, in the in the we just read a line from the prologue where it's, when I uh, they were called watchers, right? It says left to right, all around him, the watchers stood patient, faceless, silent. Then, in the very next chapter, cat or two chapters later, Catelyn is hanging out with Ned in the Godswood, and the weirwood is a faceless, silent watcher. Um, it's all the same language is used. So it makes us wonder, what's the link between the Weirwoods and the others? And before we get into any advanced theories about that, we should just be noticing the similarity. So it says, Ned's gods were the old ones, the nameless, faceless gods of the Greenwood they shared with the vanished children of the forest. But the others are nameless and faceless also. And they're called Watchers. And then in that same Catelyn chapter, she thinks about the Weirwoods keeping their watch on the uh, Isle of Faces. And in other scenes, the Weirwoods are also called Silent Watchers or Watchers. And of course, the Weirwoods are silent. They have screaming faces and make no sound. 
Uh, the weird ones have bone white bark. The others have bone white hands. Sometimes the uh, the weirwoods, when they're frozen, are even called pale shadows, just like the others. So, check out my Weirwalkers video. It's one of my most criminally underwatched videos. Ra ra ra. Weirwalkers. It's all of my uh, all of my best evidence about the others being related to the weirwoods, and it's also got my uh, Bernie Sanders stand-up comedy on there, uh, which. Probably went on for too long, but you can skip ahead uh, if you uh, it's not your thing or if you've heard that before. So I'm going to come back to this idea of them being from the woods, but I did, did want to lay out this basic idea. They are connected to the woods. They are of the fae. And I've got some especially fae looking white walkers to put up on the screen here. So this one is by, oh shit, I didn't. I don't have the name. This is one of the only ones I didn't put the name on. I could find it real quick. Hang on. By Max Philippe Peterson. See, that was quick. Quick and painless. I saw that. I'll give it to him. And then on the right, we've got this one by Giants Wood. It's a very fey looking one. And then there's uh, this one by Yogurt. It's very she-looking White Walker. Uh, same here. This is Kevin Jick. That's supposed to be the Night King himself. But again, it's just a very fae looking White Walker. So applause, applause. Uh, there's a couple more. Let's see. On the left is Manuel Castanon. And this is, you can see the ice armors looking almost black because it's so dark. It's mostly reflecting the shadows. And that is how it would look sometimes. And then on the right is Will Simpson. This is giving you like some moonlight in the trees kind of White Walker imagery. And again, you can see this looks a little bit like a grown-up frozen child of the forest or something like that. Yeah, evil cold elves, exactly. Yeah, that's it's, that's the vibe some of these images have for sure. So as we mentioned, the others bring the cold. Uh, Sam talked about the Night's Watch record saying either they come when it's cold or the cold comes with them. We don't know. Maybe they appear during snowstorms and melt away when the sky is clear. <laughs> of course, in the prologue, we read... Uh, it, they just talk about how cold it is like three times. So it says, Will, where are you? Waymar called up. Can you see anything? He was turning in a slow circle, suddenly wary, his sword in hand. He must have felt them as Will felt them. There was nothing to see. Answer me. Why is it so cold? It was cold. Shivering, Will clung more tightly to his perch. Cling to your perch, girl. His face pressed hard against the trunk of the sentinel. The wind had stopped. It was very cold. And then, of course, Val talks about when the others come, it will be so cold it hurts to breathe. So basic stuff here. But the others bring the cold, and it is so cold that it is literally hard to just be alive in their presence. So let's see here. Um, oh, here's a good quote. So this is the Vermeer quote. When Ver this is Veramir emerging from his tent. It says, when Veramir pushed at it, the snow crumbled and gave way, still soft and wet. Outside, the night was white as death. Pale, thin clouds danced attendance on a silver moon, while a thousand stars watched coldly. He could see the humped shapes of other huts, buried beneath drifts of snow, and beyond them the pale shadow of a weirwood armored in ice. So, of course, I've, I've mentioned this many times, the others are pale shadows and armored in ice. So here, the weirwood is being described as being like an other. And then it says, um, this, is, this is after w Veramir's dead. And he's in the wolf. And now, basically, what's happened is the army of the dead has moved in. And so we see that the weirwood, which was already frozen, gets more frozen. And it says, when they reached the crest, the wolves paused. Thistle, he remembered. Part of him grieved for what he had lost and another part for what he'd done. Below, the world had turned to ice. Fingers of frost crept, crept slowly up the weirwood, reaching out for each other. 
The empty village was no longer empty. Blue-eyed shadows walked amongst the mounds of snow. Some wore brown and some wore black, and some were naked, their flesh gone white as snow. A wind was sighing through the hills, heavy with their scents. Dead flesh, dry blood, skins that stank of mold and rot and urine. Sly gave a growl and bared her teeth. So, like I said, the, it, the snowstorm follows them. The cold follows them um, to the point where a tree that's already frozen is getting even more frozen. And like we, you can literally see it, like the ice just going and spreading over the bark. So it's very dramatic and edgy and uncomfortable. <laughs> She's... She's climbed to the top of the tree where she's just pacing aggressively. This is what I have to deal with. Come here, girl. <clears throat> I'll tell you what. I'll take off my hooded sweater so that you can sit on my shoulder, okay? Hang on. Come here. All right. I had a request for Super Chat there, man. Let me just get that going. So that was the that was for Desmond. Uh, but let's get all the Super Chats that have come in the past, with which we can do with digital delay. All right. I think we're caught up now. We caught up? All right. Excellent. Uh, can I get another cup of tea, sweetheart? Um, let's see. Uh, oh, there's two that I missed. Let's see. Where's the other one? Nimble dick. Yeah, I got no nose. Um, yep. Okay. I think I'm up to date. Yes. It's a miniature theremin. It's not a real theremin. It's a toy theremin. Uh, check out last week's stream. Uh, and I'll, I put it on the camera at the very end. Who did that? Where did that come from? All right. Let's see how to fight the others. So the others... They only come out at night. We only come out at night. Oh, I, I think I just upset a couple dogs. Yep, yeah, well, dogs, cats, birds. <clears throat> Barris Aurelius says there was a $2 one. Uh, no, uh, repeat the question if you know what it is. Let me see if I can quickly scroll back. Oh, there's no nose. I didn't get that one. Could the original timber high tower have been made of weirwood? Maybe the wood of high heart. The high tower sigil is a white tower, red flames above. That's interesting. Um, I had never thought of that. I'm not sure what the point would be, though, because that thing got torn down and we're never going to find it. So it's an interesting thing to speculate about, but it's not an answer that would have an effect on anything because it's gone. It could make sense. Now, I will say no, 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 that there are a lot of secrets lurking in Old Town that we haven't seen yet. So... Euron's going to crack that sucker open and we're going to find some secrets. Also, that quote with Sam earlier where he was like, well, maybe I could figure out what the others want and who they are if I had more time or if I was reading different books. And he's like, well, you're out of time. You got to go to Old Town. But of course, there's books in Old Town. <laughs> so maybe he'll find the right books to read in Old Town. This is something I hope could happen. So the others only come out at night. 
which means it's time for the art by, this is definitely one of my favorites, John Lee. John Lee, Jian Lee. Just sick. Absolutely sick. White Walker art. I've used this for a recent live stream cover. So we'll just feast our eyes on that. So Sam reads that they hide from the light of the sun and emerge by night or else night falls when they emerge. Mance Raider in A Storm of Swords says, the others never come when the sun is up. And then in A Dance with Dragons, Cold Hand says, wolves are the least of our woes. We have to climb. It will be dark soon. You would do well to be inside before night comes. Your warmth will draw them. He glanced to the west where the light of the setting sun could be seen dimly through the trees like the glow of a distant fire. So, at night, the others will get you. That's, that's kind of basic, but this is the whole point of the long night. It needs to be a permanent disruption of the solar cycle so that they can come out during the day. <clears throat> oh, the question was, how individual are the others? Yeah, none. They're identical. That seems to be a total hive mind. So, yeah, I guess I already answered that one. Yes. Yes, Tormund implies they're still somehow nearby even during the day. That's This is a great observation. I'm glad you picked up on that. I'm going to make a whole theory out of that. But first, I want to tell you that the, they are hunters. A uh, little detail that we just saw, Cold Hand says that their warmth will draw the others. And in fact, the, the others are hunters. Old Nan says of the last hero that the others smelled the hot blood in him and came silent on his trail, stalking him with packs of pale white spiders big as hounds. And also that the others hunted the maids through the frozen forests. Um, Tormund talks about how the others follow their column and pick off the stragglers and how they have to light fires um, at night and have a rear guard. And some people wake up cold or they wake up as whites. So uh, we see the same thing fleeing the first fist of the first men, right? Uh, that's how Sam encounters the other. Him and Small Paul fall behind the pack. And that is when they get nailed by the other. So yes, the others, they like to hunt. They like to herd. They like to pick off from the flanks. These are all, you know, prey animal attributes. They're very much like wolves. <clears throat> or even just human hunters. And yeah, if Cold Hand says it, it's pretty much a fact. That is correct. That is right. Um, oh, you know, I've got a really cool, let me see if I can find one I'm thinking of. But yeah, this was by Chameleon. So here we see, this is this is a white walker who's hunting you. He's got the dead wolves. He's got the beard. I don't know. He just looks like a hunter. He looks like it looks like you're you're laying on the ground and this is your last moments of your life. The dead wolves on the other are standing over you like we got you, bitch. So very cool art. It's from Manuel Castanon. No, I'm sorry. This is Chameleon. Manuel Castanon was uh Where is he? Well, it was a different one. It was the uh, this one. Yeah, that guy. Okay, so... Where were we? Chameleon. Okay, so the others are hunters. Um, they hunt the wildlings. They hunt... Uh, the... They hunt... They hunt everyone. And... In fact... Mance Raider confesses at a certain point that the entire reason the wildlings are coming south is that they are fleeing the others. And uh, John is asking why Mance Raider didn't blow the horn of winter and knock down the wall. And Mance says, blood. I'd win in the end, yes, but you'd bleed me and my people have, have bled enough. And he says, your losses haven't been that heavy. And he says, not at your hands. Man studied John's face. 
You saw the fist of the first men. You know what happened there. You know what we are facing. The others. They grow stronger as the days grow shorter and the nights colder. First they kill you, then they send their dead, your dead against you. The giants have not been able to stand against them, nor the Thens, the Ice River clans, the Hornfoots, nor you, nor me. And he says, there was anger in that admission and bitterness too deep for words. Raymond Redbeard, Bale the Bard, Gendel and Gorn, the Horned Lord, they all came south to conquer, but I've come with my tail between my legs to hide behind your wall. He touched the horn again. If I sound the horn of winter, the wall will fall, or so the songs would have me believe. There are those among my people who want nothing more. But once the wall has fallen, Dallas said, what will stop the others? So there you go. The others are hunting everyone. So the others are hunting everyone and they are driving the wildlings south. Um, it's an open question as to whether or not they're intentionally hurting people south for some objective or if they're just expanding their reach from the heart of winter. They're sort of pushing people back to the wall in preparation to cross into the lands of the living. Although it's interesting that Mance says, and yes, if you're not down with Mance, then this is the wrong channel for you. We love Mance Raider around here. Yes, we do. I had a big Mance Raider fanboy session uh, last live stream. So check that one out. Who will fight the others? Mance Raider will. He's already been fighting the White Walkers longer than anyone. And this is also a clue that the White Walkers have been active for a few years at least. You know, Mance has taken several years to unify this fighting force. And he did that because the others have been essentially moving south and menacing people more and more. So for whatever reason, the others are stirring and they are driving the wildlings south. That is basically a fact. So let's talk about, it's time for theory time, folks. Put the camera on me for just a second. Me and my pink bird. There's the pink bird. Give Cleo some, some attention. Yeah, Mance was a lot less interesting on the show. That's for sure. Ah, tea. That's right, go. No, you can't have any tea. She wants to, though. She wants to have some tea. <clears throat> so... The others are somewhat insubstantial, as a couple of people have pointed out. They disappear during the day, but they're still kind of there. So listen to this quote, all right? <clears throat> this is, okay, so first this is a cold hand. This is Bran's chapter when they're about to try to make their way up the hill into Blood Raven's cave. It's the beginning of the chapter. It says, Something about the way the raven screamed sent a shiver running up Bran's spine. I am almost a man grown, he had to remind himself. I have to be brave now. But the air was sharp and cold and full of fear. Even Summer was afraid. The fur on his neck was bristling. Shadows stretched against the hillside, black and hungry. All the trees were bowed and twisted by the weight of the ice they carried. Some hardly looked like trees at all. Buried from root to crown, in frozen snow, they huddled on the hill like giants monstrous and misshapen creatures huddled against the icy wind they are here the ranger drew his long sword where mira's voice was hushed close i don't know somewhere so cold hands can detect the presence of the others and really everyone can the hackles rise it just starts to feel weird. You picture if there were any animals, they would go silent. There probably aren't any animals here, but it's that feel of like things being too quiet. Um, Dywin notices that at the Fist of the First Men. He's like, there ain't no, no deader wood than this. You know, something's not right. Dywin's got, got a redneck voice too. Um, he's got wooden teeth. Of course he has a redneck voice. So yes, you can sort of sense the others, especially cold hands. He can sense them before they're there. And the thing is, they're definitely talking about the others here. 
as the conversation goes on, it's very clear that it is. So a couple lines later, it says, the snow had stopped three days ago, but none of it had melted. Beneath the trees, the ground was blanketed in white, still pristine and unbroken. No one's here, said Bran bravely. Look at the snow. There's no footprints. The white walkers go lightly on the snow, the ranger said. You'll find no prints to mark their passage. So, in other words, the sun hasn't set yet. But Cold Hand says, they're here. And Bran's like, oh, there's nobody here. And he's like, ah, but you don't, the white walkers don't leave footprints. So, Cold Hands is talking about the white walkers when he says, they're here. Somewhere. So even during the day, let me put it this way. Where do the walker, white walkers go during the day? They only come out at night, but where are they during the day? Do they run back to their caves? I don't think so. I don't think they have caves. I think they're still there during the day. They're just ghosts. They're insubstantial. That's what I think. And that's essentially what Cold Hands is making it sound like. He's like, well, they're here somewhere but they don't leave footprints and you can't see them, but they're here. So yes, I think they essentially disappear into a fog. I think that's essentially the answer. We saw that when one is stabbed, it evaporates into a mist. It leaves a little puddle, but it also evaporates into a mist. The real clue is this uh, Tormund Giant's Bane quote. <clears throat> Tormund Johns. Oh, actually, before I read that, um, Sam, when Sam sees the walker, it says, sword slim it was and milky white, its armor rippled and shifted as it moved, and its feet did not break the crust of the new fallen snow. So what Cold Hand's saying is saying is true. We've seen that. So what does that mean? If they don't break the snow, that means they're not entirely substantial. We know that they are somewhat substantial because the swords kill people. And if you stab them with the dragon glass, it hits a body. It's not a hologram. It hits the body. It breaks the spell. However, they don't break the snow. So they don't have weight somehow or they're floating or something, right? So I think what George is trying to show us is essentially that they're somewhere in between that they can materialize and dematerialize at will. And the kicker is this, this quote from Tormund. And let me put um, this one back on the screen because it's the most fog looking one. The one on the left, that is. So here's the Tormund quote. Tormund's talking to John and he says, or John's talking. Tormund, John said as they watched four old women pull a cart full of children toward the gate. Tell me of our foe. I would know all there is to know of the others. The wildling rubbed his mouth. Not here, he mumbled. Not on this side of the wall. The old man glanced uneasily toward the trees and their white mantles. They're never far, you know. They won't come out by day, not when that old sun's shining. But, that, but don't think that means they went away. Shadows never go away. Might be you don't see them, but they're always clinging to your heels. So what does that mean? Oh, you're not seeing the artwork. Hang on a second. There we go. So, uh, yeah, they don't go away. They're always there. They're clinging to your heels. You don't see them, but they're there. So that's, that's really interesting language, isn't it? It implies that they don't, again, go back to their cave or go back to the heart of winter. And they don't even like melt into the snow. They're just sort of insubstantial. They're literally on the wind. That's what I think. Um, and actually this torment, the fight, the quote goes further. It says, um, John asks him, did they trouble you on your way south? They never came in force, if that's your meaning, but they were with us all the same, nibbling our edges we lost more outriders than I care to think about, and it was worth your life to fall behind or wander off. 
every nightfall, we'd ring our camps with fire. They don't like fire much, and no mistake. When the snows came, though, snow and sleet and freezing rain, it's bloody hard to find dry wood or get your kindling lit. And the cold, some nights our fires just seem to shrivel up and die. Nights like that, you always find some dead come the morning, lest they find you first. <clears throat> and then he says, um, the night that Torwind, my boy, he, and that's Tormund's son, Torwind, he, he was ice whited. So Tormund's torn up as he's explaining this. He turns his face away and John says, I know. Tormund turned back. You know nothing. You killed a dead man. I, I heard. Man's killed a hundred. A man can fight the dead. But when their masters come, when the white mists rise up, how do you fight a mist, crow? Shadows with teeth. Air so cold it hurts to breathe, like a knife inside your chest. You do not know. You cannot know. Can your sword cut cold? We will see, John thought, remembering the things that Sam had told him, the things he'd found in his old books. Longclaw had been forged in the fires of old Valyria, forged in dragon flame and set with spells. Dragon steel, Sam called it, stronger than any common steel, lighter, harder, sharper. But words in a book were one thing. The true test came in battle. Oh, look, it's 420 again. And we're back. Yeah, somewhere in Alaska or like, uh, I don't know, in the Pacific somewhere. Yeah, somebody looked it up one time. Is it like Tonga or Fiji? That's on the other. That's the other 420. All right. So in any case, there's several clues here. How can you fight a mist when the white mists rise up? Shadows with teeth. Can your sword cut cold? So these are all insubstantial things. Mist, shadows, raw, cold, mists rising up. Tormund is really making it sound like the others can materialize out of the mist. And I think that is the case. I think that is exactly the case. So during the day, the others are just kind of all around you. They're on the wind. They're insubstantial. Then when the sun sets, they can just materialize. Now, I think it's worse than that. <laughs> I think it is worse than that. I think that the others, not only are they there during the day, I think that they can basically see everything. They can either see out of the weirwoods or they can see out of the stars. These are the two possibilities. Um, the idea that the weirwoods can be the eyes of the others should not be crazy. We know that the green seers can use the weirwoods eyes and the others are tied to the weirwoods. I think they are exiled green seers. So it could be that they can still use the weirwoods to spy on things. Um, for example, in the game of Thrones prologue, Ned and Kat are sitting in front of the heart tree and they're talking about Mance Raider. Ned says, Ned's talking about going north. And Ned says, Mance Raider is nothing to fear. And then Kat says, there are darker things beyond the wall. She glanced behind her at the heart tree, the pale bark and red eyes, watching, listening, thinking its long, slow thoughts. His smile was gentle. You listen to too many of old Nan's stories. The others are as dead as the children of the forest, gone 8,000 years. Maester Lewin will tell you they never lived at all. No living man has ever seen one. But of course, Ned just executed the only living man who's ever seen one, and that's Garrod. But here's the thing. What's going on in this passage? Catelyn is like, ah, but there's darker things beyond the wall. She turns and looks at the weirwood, and then Ned knows that she's talking about the others and says, ah, the others are dead. So it's almost like there's this basic low-level understanding that the, the white walkers of the wood and the white weirwoods somehow connected 
Okay. Then there's uh, Lord Commander Mormont warning people that uh, the trees have eyes again. And that's not really like Mormont is kind of pro children of the forest. He's inclined to see John's skin changer magic as a good thing. He believes the old stories. So why would the trees have eyes? Why would that be menacing? Well, that could be because the others can see out of them too. Now the others might also be watching people from the stars because they have star eyes. So what does that imply? And there are several scenes, one of which we just read, where the, uh, the, the stars appear to be watching coldly. Did you get Claire's paper, uh, super chat that I missed? Cool. I'll get that in a second, Claire. Thank you. So there's both this scene. Um, it was the Vermeer scene. Thin wisps of cloud that look like, you know, white shadows. And then the, the stars watching coldly. Um, it also, when uh, in the Eerie, when they open the moon door, there's a bunch of stars staring back coldly. And what does that tell you? That's a weirwood door of death that gets opened. And behind the weirwood door are the eyes of the others. So that's implying that the others can potentially watch out of the weirwoods, or it's simply implying that they can watch from the stars, or both. And then at the Tower of Joy, they seem to be monitoring the events. Ned sees the blue rose petals in his dream of the Tower of Joy as blue as the eyes of death. So we have the blue eyes of the others up in the sky, which is where stars are. So it makes sense that the others would be watching the Tower of Joy because John is obviously has a destiny that's tied to the others. <clears throat> so the others, they know everything that's going on. They're watching it all through the weirwoods, through the stars, or both. <clears throat> and I also think they might be able to use the weirwoods to teleport. Again, it gets worse. If they can materialize from the mist, that means they don't necessarily need to walk everywhere they need to go. You, despite their name, White Walkers, and they do walk. I don't think they have to walk everywhere on foot. If they can turn into a mist, then they can blow wherever they want and they can materialize wherever they want. <clears throat> Especially once the wall is broken. Okay. <clears throat> and the weirwoods, if to the extent that they're tied to the weirwoods, the weirwoods could be like teleportation hubs. They could essentially materialize out of the weirwoods if there are no wards present. And we've only seen places warded underground, by the way. Blood Raven's Cave is warded. Um, the wall is warded. The passage under the wall. Storm's End is warded. Probably the crypts of Winterfell. So the wards seem to be underground. But I suspect that once the, once the wall falls, the others can simply start appearing out of the God's Woods. And this is also implied in that Vermeer quote. Remember, we saw fingers of frost climbing up the weirwood. So it's almost like fingers of frost. That's like the hands of the others crawling over the weirwood tree or almost like trying to get out of the weirwood tree. It reminds me a little bit of the shadow baby being born from Melisandre, where the black shadow hands claw their way out of the womb. It's, it's basically written like that. It's very disturbing. So yeah, I think the others, um, huh, Will Ferran says they have to unlock the checkpoints before they can fast travel. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps it's behind their line of conquest. They'll be able to use the weirwoods. Now here's the thing, okay? I've talked about ice spiders a bunch of times. Let me get this PayPal before I get too lost. Got two, one from Claire. If the others are a hive mind, then why would they talk to each other and have their own languages as we see in the prologue? It doesn't add up. Well, I would say that just because there's a hive mind doesn't mean it can't enjoy a good joke with itself. You know, like when it's when it's when the others are speaking, they're speaking to Waymar. 
it seems like they're because the words were mocking so they would be mocking waymar so it's basically like the entire hive mind pointing and laughing um also just because it's a hive mind doesn't mean it can't express itself like it's not don't think about the others talking to each other like hey do you want to kill them now yeah let's do it they don't need to do that um remember it says as if some silent signal had been given, they all advanced as one and began stabbing Waymar. So they don't need to talk. They're telepathically linked or they are of the same mind, but they can still speak. It's just the words of the hive mind. And then no, 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 no says, uh, sounds like herd dogs pushing the free folk south. Yes, exactly. Commenting on the bit about the hunters. That's exactly, they're like wolves herding their prey or sharks or velociraptors. There's a lot of prey animals that, that do that actually. Fish do it, um, various kinds of predator fish, they do that. They'll chase a herd, a school of prey fish. They'll direct them in certain directions and then sort of feed off the, the edges. I was just watching a documentary about that. Uh, Stephanie, first time catching a stream. Well, hello, Stephanie. We're happy to have you. And the Spargmeister says, in the north of the wall, whites might always be watching from just beyond the line of sight. Well, the whites seem to sleep under the snow. Like we see that on the hill outside of Blood Raven's cave. They don't wake up until nightfall and they don't wake up until our brand's company is trying to walk up the hill. And we know it's been snowing for three days and the snow is unbroken. So they don't get up every night. They only get up when either when there's people nearby, when they can smell hot blood, you know, or when the others want them to get up. So <clears throat> I don't think the whites are always watching, but the others, the others certainly are. So here's the thing, ice spiders. Let me show you. First of all, we don't know if ice spiders exist but they could. And the first, these first two, this is, uh, oh, sorry. Um, yes. Mark Simonetti on the left and also Mark Simonetti on the right. Actually, these are Mark Simonetti. He likes ice spiders so much. He took two bites at the apple. These are almost a decade apart, by the way. So for what it's worth. So the ice spiders, here's the thing. Okay. The others are made out of ice. Um, so could they make other things out of ice? Potentially they make armor and swords out of ice. And George says they can do things out of with ice that nobody else can. Um, so, you know, we're told that there are ice dragons and the ice dragon is essentially like an other, but in dragon form, it's completely made out of ice and it too melts into a puddle when killed. <clears throat> and uh, we've, we'll talk about the ice dragons in a minute, but if there are ice dragons, there could be ice spiders. We don't know if, how these magical creatures were created. If the Night King made them once, you know, he turned, he created a race of ice spiders, kind of like Sauron created various races of monsters and dragons and things. <clears throat> or it could be that the others can make anything they want and they just like to make spiders and dragons. Who knows? Or maybe they don't make ice dragons at all. We don't know that, of course. But I think ice spiders are more about symbolism than actually, than real ice spiders. Let me put up my next bit of ice spider artwork. We're going to show all the ice spider artwork. I love ice spiders. This one is by David Romero on the right. Um, then there's the classic by Jimmy P. Duda. This is perhaps the most terrifying ice spider. The giant pinchers, the blue eyes. I mean, that's friggin' scary. Um, <laughs> and uh, this one by Russell Dong Jun Lu is perhaps more terrifying because this is a mama ice spider and her eggs have just hatched and there's a bunch of baby ice spiders running around on the ground. <laughs> yeah, eek. What's the name of that spooky sound effect? Um, that is 
Oh, uh, the one that I play while reading chapters in my videos. Um, well, I, the theremin is the sound effect, but the 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 uh, the music, the background music that I use when uh, reading quotes in my videos, that is uh, all stuff that I've made with my bass guitar and like twenty effects pedals. So it's me trying to you know do my best David Gilmore, Radiohead sort of impression uh, with the bass and the pedals. So. That's all my, that's my inner turmoil. That's what that is. That's what that effect is. So here's the thing, okay? What are ice spiders really? Well, I think the big clue is in the quote that we just read from Cold Hands. Or at least it's Brand's chapter with Cold Hands. It says, shadows stretched against the hillside, black and hungry. All the trees were bowed and twisted by the weight of the ice they carried. Some hardly looked like trees at all. Buried from root to crown in frozen snow, they huddled on the hill like giants, monstrous and misshapen creatures, hunched against the icy wind. So a tree that gets frozen and weighted down with snow looks like a misshapen monster. Now, let me share a little picture from the TV show. And this is one of the things that made it click for me. I'll pull up these two here. Sorry, I don't have these ones in the presentation. But I've got them right here. So in the show... At the heart of winter or somewhere at the center of the other's power, we saw this frozen tree. Originally, it was the Weirwood where the Night King was created. And you can see the standing stones around the tree. But now the tree is frozen and, and probably dead. And you can see it's weighed down. And the branches curl back down and touch the ground. It looks just like a big fucking spider, doesn't it? And here's the other picture. It's further away. I'm going to zoom in on the upper part. You can see it looks like a giant spider made out of ice. And that's what I think the ice spiders are. Because we're told that the others ride on the ice spiders. Well, the thing is, if they're green seers, if the others are undead green seers, then they could still be using the weirwood magic. And if a frozen tree looks like an ice spider, well, a fr they're just talking about frozen weirwoods. Well, we've seen that. Like the frozen weirwood tree is described as a, uh, a pale shadow armored in ice. So a frozen weirwood tree looks like an other. And a frozen weirwood tree looks like an ice spider. And the others used are tied to the weirwood magic. So if they are using the weirwoods to either spy on people or to, like I was saying, teleport and dematerialize, then they would be riding the ice spiders. Now, it's also said that the others ride down on the winds of winter. But of course, spiders ride the wind. That's how they travel, especially the baby spiders. They float on the wind, right? Well, green seers also fly. When they use the weirwood trees, they're flying. And when they talk through the weirwood trees, they use the wind rustling in the leaves. So the others riding on the winds, the others riding on the spiders, it really just sounds like George is telling us that the others ride the weirwoods. And then, yes, like Odin riding on Sleipnir, exactly. Sleipnir is an astral projection horse that Od allows Odin to traverse the realms. But Sleipnir is an eight-legged horse. And spiders have eight legs. And we know that uh, George is using Odin symbolism not only for Blood Raven and the Green Seers, but also for Knight's King figures. So it's strongly implied that Knight's King or the others, they are like Odin wizards too. Okay. <clears throat> so the idea of them riding on ice spiders, it really does sound like riding on Sleipnir. But Sleipnir is used for astral projection, guys. And so are the Weirwoods. So if the others are riding 
If the others are using the weirwoods to astrally project, then they are, in fact, riding the weirwoods just as Odin rides Sleipnir. Now, even worse, it says the others hunted the last hero on their packs of ice spiders. So they're using the spiders to hunt, guys. This again is telling you the weirwood that the others can see through the weirwoods. They use the frozen weirwoods to hunt you. And again, the show got this right. They showed Night King contacting Bran inside the weirwood net, inside the weirwood dream. And I think that this is possible. I think that this will happen in the books as well. At some point, Bran will confront an other-like presence in the weirwood net. And I, like I said, I think the others are using the weirwoods or will be able to when the wall falls. Yeah, I'm dropping, I'm dropping the fucking mic here on you guys. That's I told you I was going to thank this is what you get for staying two and a half hours into an LML live stream. You get a hot new theory or maybe a cold new theory. So let's finish this up. Here is Bran in the Weirwood Caves, Blood Raven's cave. The way was cramped and twisty, and so low that Hodor soon was crouching. Bran hunched down as best he could, but even so, the top of his head was soon scraping and bumping against the ceiling. Loose dirt crumbled at each touch and dribbled down into his eyes and hair, and once he smacked his brow on a thick white root growing from the tunnel wall, with tendrils hanging from it and spider webs between its fingers. So the weirwood root, there's one main root, and then there's the little filament roots, and the filament roots are what's like the spider web. So the weirwood net, the network of weirwood roots is like a spider web. And this is also a shout out to the Norns of Norse mythology. The Norns, of course, sit below Yggdrasil and they weave everyone's fates through weaving with threads. And so here we have the weirwood roots like fingers with threads in their, in their hands. So this is a shout out to the Norns. Then it goes on and it says, the child went in front, that's a child of the forest, with a torch in her hand, her cloak of leaves whispering behind her, but the passage turned so much that Bran soon lost sight of her. Then the only light was what was reflected off the passage walls. After they had gone down a little, the cave divided, but the left branch was dark as pitch, so even Hodor knew to follow the moving torch to the right. <clears throat> the way the shadow shifted made it seem as if the walls were moving too. Bran saw great white snakes slithering in and out of the earth around him, and his heart thumped in fear. He wondered if they had blundered into a nest of milk snakes or giant grave worms, soft and pale and squishy. Grave worms have teeth. <clears throat> so... All of the things that George is comparing the weirwood roots to are very important here. They're like snakes because, as we've talked about, under Yggdrasil there are many snakes. In particular is the Nidhogger serpent. And Bloodraven himself is a version of Nidhogger. He is a serpent living in the roots of the weirwood tree, trapped in the roots even. But that symbolism is doubled up by the roots themselves looking like snakes. They also look like grave worms because the weirwoods eat the dead, right? They're consuming blood raven, and the only people that live inside the weirwood net are dead green seers. So dead people live inside weirwoods. They consume the dead physically and, and like spiritually. So they're like grave worms. They're like snakes, and they're like spiders' fingers because weirwoods can be ice spiders and because of the norns. Um, now, going back to the cold hands quote, there's actually something I missed that I just caught. Just figured this out. So check this out. Um, shadows stretched against the hillside, black and hungry. All the trees were bowed and twisted by the weight of the ice they carried. Some hardly looked like trees at all. Buried from root to crown in frozen snow, they huddled on the hill like giants, monstrous and misshapen creatures. So they look... Again, the ice spiders are called giant ice spiders. So giant misshapen monsters, giant ice spiders. But listen to that line, buried from root to crown. That's, that's the chakras, root chakra to crown chakra. That's the, the bottom and the top. 
So what, what he's saying is that these trees have been transformed from root to crown. So that this is an allusion to the tree as the spine of a human being. And that's, of course, the whole point of the cosmic axis. Ultimately, it is the spine of the human. And so the spine, the tree, the cosmic ladder, the cosmic axis, these things are all made similar. That's where the kundalini spirit comes in. When you, when you conjure the kundalini energy, it rides up the spine to the top from root to crown, and it transforms you. So what he's implying, George, who is an old hippie and knows about all this fucking shit, he's basically saying these trees, these trees that are transformed into ice spiders, they've been transformed from root to crown. So it's implying a spiritual transformation. These are weirwood trees that have been altered and corrupted and frozen, just like the others have been frozen. So I really think that George is trying to show us this. The ice spiders are essentially just code for the others using the weirwoods. And when you put all that together, it means that the others can ride the weirwoods, they can see out of the weirwoods, and potentially materialize right out of the weirwoods and use them to hunt. So there you have it. <clears throat> In short, the long night's going to be even worse than anyone imagined. Thank you all for coming. Ah, uh, no, there is a catch. We do have allies. We've got an ancient enemy. We've also got ancient allies. And let's change up the art. Because this isn't even art. It's actually just an HBO screenshot. Let's see here. Oh, that's right. I need to put the presentation back up. <whistles> Definitely getting better at running the production here while I am streaming, I have to say. Not as much downtime as it used to be. And I know you guys really appreciate having the art. So it's a couple more ice spiders to show you. We love ice spiders. This is John Howe. This is from the cover of a different calendar. It's a recent calendar, I think. So here you see the ice spider really does made purely of ice. And the others riding it up there. Uh, Thomas Kwiatkowski imagines the ice spider as being made out of like dead things and spears and stuff. That's kind of cool. It's not canon, but it's definitely cool. And there you have it. Um, so let's see here. The long night. Oh, there's an ice spider in the background. That's why I have this one here. You can see the ice spider next to the others there. Oh, and they're also crawling up the wall behind in the background or crawling down the wall. Okay, that's terrifying. All right. So we do have, friends, we do have an ally. We have an ancient ally, and it is the children of the forest. Again, this one is Blue Ultramare. The children of the forest, as we read, they arm the watch with dragon glass. So that's nice. Because if you have enough dragon glass, you can kill as many others as you need. Um, the children also help the last hero. Okay, so old Nan's story drops off where it says the children's, uh, the last hero's dog and his horse had died, his friends died, and he was alone and hunted. The others were coming on his trail. But then later, he emerges with a blade of dragon steel, right? So the way that we know that is um, after Old Nan's story gets interrupted, the Black Brothers are talking about Benjen. And Yorin says, well, maybe he will, maybe he won't find his way home. Good men have gone into those woods and never come back out. And all Bran could think of was Old Nan's story of the others and the last hero, hounded through the woods by dead men and spiders big as hounds. He was afraid for a moment. And by the way, hounded through the white woods. That's another weirwood clue. Bran was afraid for a moment until he remembered how that story ended. And then he blurts out, the children will help him, talking about Benjen, the children of the forest. So even though we don't hear the end of Old Nan's story, we know that it ended with the children helping the last hero. Then separately, 
we hear about uh, the line in Hothor Umber's song, the part in the night that ended where the Night's Watch rode forth to meet the others in the battle for the dawn. So at some point after the children of the forest helped the last hero, the Night's Watch appears. And now they're riding forth into battle. And we also know the last hero comes out on the other side of the story with dragon steel. So in between cold alone hunted by the others with a broken sword and with the night's watch with dragon steel, he receives help from the children. So we know the children played a pivotal role, pivotal in turning around the war for the dawn. The first one. And uh, the world of ice and fire tells us this as well. It says, "How long the long night, or how the long night came to an end, is a matter of legend, as all such matters of the distant past have become." In the north, they tell of the last hero who sought out the intercession of the children of the forest, his companions abandoning him or dying one by one as they faced ravenous giants, cold servants, and the others themselves. Alone, he finally reached the children, despite the efforts of the White Walkers, and all the tales agree this was a turning point. Thanks to the children, the first men of the Night's Watch banded together and were able to fight and win the battle for the dawn, the last battle that broke the endless winter and sent the others fleeing to the icy north. So obviously this is the Maesters summarizing legend here. But again, it's the same story. The children helped the Night's Watch. Now, again, this is supported by evidence. We know that the children give the Night's Watch dragon glass to fight the others. And we also know that before, that the, the, the first Night's Watchmen would have all been first men. Before the Andals came, they would have all been first men, which means all the Night's Watchmen would have worshipped the old gods, worshipped, which means that all of the Night's Watchmen would have sworn their oaths in front of weirwood trees, just like John and Sam do. So this is Pablo Pugioni here. And uh, this is Didier Graffé on the left. So Night's Watchmen who worship the old gods, they say their vows in front of the heart tree, which means that when they swear to defend the living, I am the sword in the darkness, I will not leave my post until my death, blah, 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 blah. I am the, and the horn that wakes the sleepers. They're swearing all these things to the green seers, to the people inside the weirwood trees which means children of the forest. So the children of the forest help the last hero. They help the humans organize against the others. They arm them. And they may have helped with magic. And then we see that the Night's Watch in, you know, forever after in perpetuity, they swear their oaths to those same green seers. So basically what you've got here is a partnership. The Night's Watch was created by the children of the forest and in, in part is sustained by the children of the forest. So to this day, we see the children helping a former Lord Commander of the Watch, Blood Raven, or at least giving him a place to live and giving him access to weirwood magic. And they're trying to help Bran become what he needs to be to fight the others. Now, I don't want to get into the debates about Blood Raven's true motives and all that stuff. I do believe that they're focused on fighting the others, as it appears. So the children of the forest, they are again helping the humans. And one of the key things to think about surviving the long night are the warded underground caves, right? It's underground, it stays a constant 50 some degrees, no matter what's happening above. So down in the caves, it's not going to be as cold as upstairs. Down in the caves, you're protected from the others and the whites because of the wards. Down in the caves, we've seen the cave network may go through all through Westeros and there's underground rivers. So this is a way that people could move around also. If you have the children of the forest with you, they could potentially guide you from castle to castle underground. The children of the forest also have a certain amount of food there's mushrooms that grow underground and there's fish in the underground rivers. So we can see that the children of the forest have all the secrets. They know how to kill the whites with fire. They know how to use dragon glass. 
they know how to make magical wards that the others and the whites can't get by. They know how to hide in the caves. They know the caves. So you can see that the allies that, that we need are the children of the forest. To a lesser extent, the wolves and ravens, which are, of course, the animals tied to green seer magic. But there we go. We're not entirely defenseless against the others. We have Valerian steel. We have dragons. We have the children. We've got the cave networks. We've got the dragon glass. And you know what would really be good against the others is wildfire. If we could save any of that from King's Landing, that'd be nice. But uh, that about does it. Uh, I, I do have a couple more. Let's see. Of course, we know the children also. We've not seen cold hands and the children walking together as this picture from Diego or did he? I think, yeah, this is Diego Gisbert Lorenz here. And uh, we've not seen this, but this is probably a true thing that happens. If cold hands is working with the Ravens and with blood Raven, he's working with the children too. Um, it could even be the children of the forest are the ones who have the magic to undo a cold white. Cause obviously cold hands was made into a cold white. And then somehow he was freed from that bondage on the show. Children of the forest did that with dragon glass. So we don't know how that's going to be in the books, but it would make sense that the children are the ones who made cold hands. And here's some more cold hands art. This one is by Didier Graffé. This one is by Westland. And this one is by Blue Ultramare. This really captures the deadness of Cold Hands and his black eyes. So final topic would be the Ice Dragon. I alluded to the Ice Dragon. This is by Anato Finstark. And this one is by Juan Carlos Barquette. So there's two possibilities for an ice dragon, right? We could either see the actual ice dragon, which is made out of ice and breathes cold and melts and all that. Or we could see a whited dragon, more like on the TV show. I think both are equally possible. Viserion has a lot of ice dragon symbolism. So I really do think it's possible that we could get a whited Viserion much like on the show. And it kind of makes sense too. Like we need a dragon fight right now. All three dragons are on the same team. So we either need Euron to steal a dragon or we need the others to steal a dragon or produce an ice dragon in order to have a dragon fight. And we know that George wants to have a dragon fight because fire and blood was dedicated to dragon fights. That's the crux of fire and blood. So we know dragon fights are coming. We need a, a dragon to get stolen either by, like I said, Euron and Dragonbinder or by the others. So I do think that ice dragons exist. I'm just not sure if George is going to show us one, the actual ice dragon. But he might. But he might. I think it's more meaningful if one of Danny's dragons gets stolen. That's That's... That's probably what's going to, I would say, is more likely. So real quick here, I will circle back for any super chats and PayPals I may have missed. Natasha Love says, finally caught a live stream. Do you think they were making fun of Waymar's overly fancy cloak? <laughs> now they were making fun of Waymar bleeding like a pathetic mortal. Because I, you see, once Waymar's wounded, his blood falls to the snow and they see it. And uh, fire whites don't have flowing blood, neither do cold hand style ice whites. So if they had stabbed him and he hadn't reacted or hadn't bled, then they would have been afraid of him. But once they saw him bleed, they know he's only a puny mortal and they dispatched him. That, that's what I think happened there. But that's just a theory, of course. Drew asks, um, is it possible the horned men shrunk into the children of the forest like the dragons shrunk at the end of the Targaryen dynasty. Uh, that's not a crazy idea, Drew Thompson. The green men do sound like tall children of the forest, so it could be a cousin race. But yeah, that could be like divergent evolution. That's not crazy. But the children of the forest have always said to have been small. 
So I think if there was a divergent evolution, it would have been a long time ago. Long time ago. So then uh, PayPal's... Oh, I owe you some there, man. Ooh, that was... Oh, that was interesting. Uh, Jelena says... Oh, it's Hypatia. No question. Just sending in love for Cleo. All right, Hypatia. You hear that, girl? Somebody loves you. Who am I kidding? Everybody loves you, girl. I don't mind you when you settle down and just hold still and chill out. Thank you. Okay. So there you go, guys. Last call for questions. We're almost at three hours, so I'm definitely time to wrap it up. As you can see, Fighting the others is going to be tough. We're definitely going to need the dragons. Without the dragons, I don't even know how you could resist the whites at all. Um, there's not enough fire or even wildfire to burn all the whites before they overrun you. And again, they absorb all of your enemies into their army. So without the dragons, I don't see any way to resist the whites. Um, in the original Long Night, this is something I want to clarify. I'm not going to do the whole old man quote, but there's a couple lines that are interesting. In that darkness, the others came for the first time. They were cold things, dead things that hated iron and fire um, and every creature with hot blood in its veins. They swept over holdfasts and cities and kingdoms, felled heroes and armies by the score. And we're, we're also told that children were born and grew to adulthood in darkness. So it was a darkness that lasted a generation. So this is the thing. Um, Karsnark, I said she wasn't setting on, sitting on my white sweater, and she didn't. I took that off before I put her on my shoulder. So don't make me out to be more of a pushover than I am. Thank you very much, Karsnark. Disgraceful. In any case... Um, Hold fast, armies, kingdoms, plural. So that means that literally they, this wasn't one battle. It was many battles. It was years. It was a gradual advance. They ate up whole kingdoms. They ate up armies. So this fight against the others could go on for a while. Could go on until a new last hero's mission is completed to the heart of winter. That's essentially what we're looking for. So thank you, friends. That's pretty much everything I can tell you about fighting the others, how it's going to go and how you want to approach it. You want dragons. You want dragons. You want Valerian steel. As I pointed out, Valerian steel is a really good weapon because if it can slay the others, but you can also light it on fire, now you have a weapon that can slay the others or the whites. A Valerian steel sword lit on fire. That's the best thing short of dragon fire. So hopefully the Lords of the Seven Kingdoms will surrender up their Valerian steel. I have a feeling Danny might help round that up and uh, send it north so that we can set it on fire. Melisandre will be there as a fire other. She should be able to light plenty of swords on fire. Anybody that's a fire white can light their sword. So yes. Flaming swords and dragons. Anything else is really not going to do much. Um, like I said, if we could save some wildfire, that would be good. Trenches full of wildfire would at least stop the whites. And if you could sort of pen them in to a U-shaped enclosure and then set it on fire, the whites, like I said, are so flammable that they may catch and, and combust the entire crowd. But you'd really have to have them penned in. And then there's the problem of the cold, which puts out the flames. So again, dragon fire is the key. Wildfire is the kind of flame that could resist the cold as well. So that's what we got. So, okay, friends, thanks for watching. Again, I will ask you to please leave a comment on the way out. The increased comments have been helping the videos. I need you guys to keep it up. Like 300 people watching, please, everyone, if everyone clicks like and leaves a comment, YouTube will send this video straight to the top of the pile, show it to lots of people. I will make more money. You guys will be helping me. It doesn't even cost anything but like 
30 seconds of time. So please do leave a comment. Please do like the video. And I will see you again with another War for the Dawn stream either on Wednesday or Sunday and pretty much always at the 3 p.m. Pacific time. So it's been a beautiful audience. We'll get through this together and uh, come out the other side victorious. God willing. Old God's willing, I should say. Relore willing. All right, folks. See you later.